listening to episode 177 of Mita Life Radio. I'm Matt Blackburn, and today, Jason Hommel returns to the show. He is the author of the book, The Copper Revolution. And lately, he said he thought about switching the name to the Copper Zinc Revolution because these two minerals work together in a really powerful way. In the last two years, a lot of people have been taking only zinc, ascorbic acid, and vitamin D, and none of the other things that balance those out. Now, I still don't recommend vitamin D, neither does Jason, but with the other two that I mentioned, those are balanced out simply by taking copper, which he advocates and he doesn't sell a copper supplement. He recommends making it yourself using copper sulfate dissolved in a two ounce dropper bottle. And that way you can make a bottle with over a thousand milligrams for three cents. So right there, that knocks out two arguments that he might be biased because he's selling a copper supplement or the other argument that it's too expensive and supplements are expensive. Both of those are shot down with what he talks about. So if you haven't heard the first interview that I did with Jason, I highly recommend going back and listening to that one on the myth of copper toxicity, because that brings some context to this discussion about the mineral zinc, because you can't talk about zinc without talking about copper. And as far as I've heard in lectures, podcasts, books. Not a lot of people delve into the relationship between copper and zinc. And it was experience that taught Jason because when he was high dosing copper, 30 milligrams orally, 70 milligrams transdermally with the copper sulfate, he found that he created a zinc deficiency, which will happen if you are upping your copper. So a lot of people are confused about how much to take of supplements and it really comes down to how much you're taking of their counterpart and or how much you've been dosed with. And they have dosed people very heavily on vitamin D and calcium. And Jason and I are on the same page there that we should not be supplementing vitamin D or calcium. And he also recommends against other supplements, which he talks about in this show. But on the topic of zinc, we talk about metallothionine, which is a protein in the liver that gets upregulated when you start consuming copper or zinc. Uh, he talks about the RDA for zinc, the health benefits of zinc, the copper zinc optimal ratio, how zinc can actually help us absorb more copper. Uh, the connection with zinc to vitamin A, the digestive benefits of zinc, um, how to test it if blood tests are accurate. And we also talk about iodine, selenium, and vitamin C. And at the end, I ask him listener questions, uh, including the best time of day to take zinc. Does it help with loss of smell? Does it help with hair loss? What's the best form? Does zinc increase sperm count? Does zinc in sunscreen affect your zinc status? Are white spots in the nails a sign of zinc deficiency? Is the zinc test tasting it in your mouth? If it tastes metallic, is that an accurate way to determine whether your body needs it or not? Best food sources of zinc and why someone might get a headache from taking zinc. This was a really fun show and it helped connect a lot of dots for me and hopefully it does for you as well. Here is Jason Hommel. All right, Jason Hommel, welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me. It sounds like we're going to have another good show today. Yeah, the first one was really fun and people really enjoyed that uh, because there's, there's a lot of information out there about zinc, which we're going to talk about today but not a lot about copper. And what I found fascinating 
is uh, looking into the relationship between <clears throat> those two minerals lately and how they're kind of joined at the hip, right? I mean, you could just slam your body with copper all day long, but as you said on your group, you'll just deplete your zinc if that's not coming in. That's right. That's, that's, I mean, that's right. I mean, I, yeah, uh, I, I tried it Morley's way, you know, as I was finishing up uh, writing my book, um, he convinced me to try a lower amount of zinc. Um, before I get into that, I want to just say how much zinc I'm taking. And I got to ask you how much zinc you're taking. I'm taking anywhere between about 50 to hundred milligrams of zinc a day. Um, and I'm taking about uh, 30 milligrams of copper a day and I'm, and I'm applying about 70 milligrams of copper to my skin. Um, so I'm trying to find a balance between those two going back and forth. But um, yeah, just right about there. How much are you taking? Yeah, so um, I'll just preface this <laughs> with, uh, I think since our last interview, that's when I started applying copper primarily topically, but I was taking it orally as well. And I think for the last, I don't know, five, six weeks, I forget how long our, our last show was ago, um, I was taking roughly uh, 20 milligrams orally, usually bisglycinate. Um, and then I was applying to my skin. I think I calculated it was it was about 100 milligrams. It was a significant amount. And I was feeling good. Wow, okay. Yeah. Um, but, but uh, and I know okay. we only absorb, you know, cert we don't absorb all of that, so... Um, I don't know, I was probably getting right. 50, 60, 70 milligrams, but, uh, I posted in your group. It was funny because I was visiting my dad in California and my hands <laughs> turned blue and my, my mom was freaking out and she's like, is that permanent? I'm like, no, don't worry about it. I'm just trying this new thing. And, uh, and then he said, <laughs> rub ascorbic acid on your hands. And so I broke a capsule in my hands, rubbed it under their filtered water. And that immediately took out the color. But what's interesting is the very next morning I woke up and my hands were bright red. Um, it looked like I saw Sedona, that. Arizona rocks. Like, <laughs> and so, and you responded. You said take zinc, and so I had some of that. And so I started on that, and within a couple days, I mean, within the first day, it started to fade, and so that really made me start to see the relationship between these minerals, and so I started on zinc and. I think I started at a very modest amount, maybe, I don't know, 20, 30 milligrams a day, maybe a maximum of 50. And then lately, I've just been experimenting with higher doses. Um, and I'm not just uh, shooting in thin air here. I, I got a full Monty iron panel uh, recently, and my copper and zinc were not optimal. Um, I, think, I think they're supposed to be 100 or 120, and they're around 70. So I had both, I don't know, 60 to 70 range. And that's, I know there's plasma zinc and the testing is a whole nother topic. But um, from what I understand, uh, copper and zinc are only like 1% in the blood and the rest is in the tissues. And so those tests aren't very accurate, right? They're, they're not accurate. And I, I wouldn't worry that your copper is a bit low because, um, uh, first of all, there's almost no studies and data on people who are taking high copper. So we really don't know what is going to happen with what it's going to look like in our blood. But from the research that I have read, it shows that uh, copper can be high in the blood during copper deficiency, um, during all sorts of copper deficiency diseases, from, whether from inflammation or heart disease or whatever. And then they start to give copper to solve those problems. They have to give enough to work. Maybe, you know, and the, the researchers that I have to guess at how much they use, maybe six to 10 milligrams most at most because they're all very super conservative. Uh, and then what happens next is that the uh, blood copper goes up a little higher and then it starts to cure the situation or disease or inflammation or heart disease or whatever. And then the copper comes back down. So at our high levels, it should come back down and we might not have even average levels because the other thing is that uh, the body gets very efficient at processing and eliminating copper, which we're going to talk about a little bit later when we talk about metallothionine, because the body will make more of that, which helps to carry copper out of the body. So as the more copper you take, the more copper you will excrete, which goes to show that copper is not toxic and cannot be toxic until you overwhelm this excretion mechanism, which in rats happens at 5,000 milligrams a day or higher, 10,000 milligrams a day. And what is theorized is that the reason why they're able to sustain such a high level 
is and and why they get overwhelmed is that the rats start making a ton more metallothionine which excretes the copper and it's only when that whole system gets overwhelmed that then copper toxicity sets in so in that whole process almost refutes the entire concept of there being a copper toxicity by accident because real toxicity happens at these extremely high doses or in humans who take 20,000 milligrams of copper so um i don't fear what your morally panel is showing because again those uh tests are not very accurate for copper now for zinc it's a little bit of a different story because zinc is very tightly regulated and I, I don't know if high zinc could indicate low zinc like copper can but um when zinc goes low you're definitely low because uh by that time you're you've bypassed your homost static mechanism or whatever and I tested low zinc way back in, um, oh gosh, what was it, uh, 2016. Um, and I started taking more zinc then. I also started taking more copper because I was also a little bit low in copper, didn't know anything back then. I just, uh, and that's really got me, what got me started on the road to studying minerals so much. It was right around 2016. Wow. Yeah, I'm trying to remember what year, it, I think it was 20, 2018, 2019, I was slamming oysters. Um, cause I was on this quantum health, you know, Jack Cruz protocol. I've tried so many protocols over the years and it was like naked sunbathing, grounding, sun gazing, and just tons and tons of seafood. And I felt pretty good. And I actually got a, uh, inside tracker, uh, like panel, I think it was 30 markers. And what was interesting is my testosterone was, uh, 1268. Uh, so it was, it was over 1200. From the oysters. <laughs> Zinc, yeah, I guess. Right. The, right. <laughs> yeah, but I was probably low copper, so. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. Right. Well, yeah, maybe. <laughs> but young young men are typically not low in minerals unless you've done really bad things like drink too much alcohol or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'd like to talk about that. What what depletes? Uh, and I think we had some people ask that. I think obviously sexual activity. That's usually what people think of of, of zinc. Um, I think Adam Bergstrom said some interesting no, things. No, I don't think you can really deplete. I don't think you can really deplete zinc from too much sexual activity. I mean, yes, it's all well known that semen contains zinc, but it's the amounts are so small. It's you know, it's fractions of a milligram. Yeah, I think I read that. Yeah, it's kind of like with a uh, women's menstrual bleeding and iron. It's like one milligram or less. Like you don't lose as yeah, much as you like, think. It's not enough. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Interesting. Um, yeah. So, it. so let's, we, let's mention the RDA right here in the beginning for zinc, right? I mean, these are the basics. So, I mean, the, the RDA for zinc, I, I tried to get a handle on it. It's somewhere between uh, 10 and 15 milligrams. And then the upper limit's around 40. Okay. But I take 50. <laughs> <laughs> so the reason, at least I got to the, at least I got to the reason on why it's 40. And that is uh, because over that, too much zinc can deplete copper. Or around that, I guess some people have noted that zinc can deplete copper if it's as if you take as little as 25 milligrams of zinc. But um, so I find it interesting that the government has set it at 40. It's um, it can be a little high, right? So I don't know. Yeah, and that's something I've been beating the drum on, um, thanks to Morley for the last two years. Is with this whole COVID thing, they've just been pushing. You know, it's like zinc, uh, zinc, ascorbic acid, vitamin D, and like yeah, that, people are just climbing those. Will deplete copper. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. And no copper I mean, coming in, right? And that's... all three of those can. And nobody mentions copper for COVID, but I did in the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because if <laughs> copper was coming in, and those, I mean, uh, vitamin D is pretty hard to mitigate. But if if copper is coming in, then your body could balance out a lot, right? You've written about the interrelationships between. What is it? Iodine and vitamin C, and um, they all kind of work together. They they do. I take quite a lot of minerals and and vitamins. Vitamin C is probably the vitamin I like I like the most. I love iodine as my second favorite mineral. Zinc might be my third. Uh, Copper is my favorite mineral, of course. But um, zinc's got a lot of good things going for it too. It it does indeed help us uh, boost testosterone. It helps improve sleep. Uh, zinc. Uh, eliminates allergies and histamine reactions and rashes and all of the almost all of those tie together because 
Um, you need sleep for healing, testosterone for healing. And uh, when you get zinc, it helps bring all those together. And if you can heal, then, of course, you're going to heal from things like rashes and um, uh, allergies and sinus problems. It's kind of funny. I used to think that, um, well, I don't have allergies. I just have a runny nose. But we should almost think of it as the same thing. You know, you don't have to be diagnosed with allergies to be low zinc, you know. Um, uh, runny nose is going to be just, just as bad. So it, nowadays, if I even just sneeze once for no reason, ah, I probably need a zinc. Yeah, recently I learned with the, that diamine oxidase enzyme, the DAO enzyme, like people are taking, um, eating kidney or doing desiccated kidney because kidney contains the DAO enzyme, or I think you could just straight supplement that enzyme. Uh, but if you want to make it in your body, uh, I recently learned that you need not just copper, like I believe for the last two years, but you need copper plus zinc plus uh, vitamin plus C, zinc. right? You need like multiple things. It's usually not just one thing. <laughs> right. Uh, that's another thing we're going to get into. Yeah. Quite a few of these, um, like metallothionine, and you need quite a few ingredients to make it. Um, uh, but uh, it's interesting how it's interesting how in the studies, even just taking a ton of copper will make the metallothionine creation go through the roof to deal with just the copper. And you'll need copper as an ingredient to make metallothionine as well as zinc, um, as well as uh, selenium and uh, sulfur and protein all is, are needed to make metallothionine. Yeah, that, that was something interesting I found about your work is the metallothionine uh, research because um, interviewing Morley, he's brought it up a lot, I think almost every show or every other show. And he, he often um, says that it binds copper a thousand times stronger than zinc. And that's a really bad thing. Um, and, and it can be, right? But, but what I didn't know is that it's also our is it our primary heavy metal detoxifier? That's how we detoxify heavy metals is via metallothionine. And it has a lot of different beneficial functions besides just depleting our copper. <laughs> right. It doesn't just deplete copper. I have read researchers. Well, first of all, metallothionine is actually a family of metallothionine enzymes. It's not just one. Uh, and then the other is that um, I was just reading and reading about zinc because I had to study for the show at least a little bit and learn a little bit more things. Um, they don't really know exactly what all metallothionines will do because, A, there's so many. And um, just because they bind something doesn't mean that it's bound for excretion. Some researchers have described metallothionines as storage proteins. Some of them describe it as transport pr a protein and others describe it as an excretion protein. So it can do quite a few different things. I mean, if you're transporting something, you're transporting it where? to a location to do something so it can store it and it can i mean just like people call ferritin right ferritin is uh, it's not iron it's an iron binding protein and it's in the blood so it's transporting it in the blood but they call it a storage protein well metallothionine could be a storage protein too um we don't really know there's so many unknowns we need to be a little bit more cautious when we say things i think mm -hmm. yeah so, so going back, that's interesting. The RDA is 10 to 15 milligrams, which to me doesn't sound like enough. Just thinking about it, you said the upper limit is, is 40 mm -hmm. milligrams. Um, but well, and what's interesting is that just on a carnivore diet, people can get 60 milligrams of zinc. And in oysters, if you eat plenty of oysters, you can get easily into the 100 to 150 milligram ranges for zinc because oysters are so ridiculously high in zinc. Um, yeah, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Do you think a lot of the people on the carnivore diet are copper deficient if they're if they're just slamming muscle meats? Like there's a lot of people that are just eating steaks for breakfast, lunch and dinner. I have seen a, a pro copper people who were carnivore realize that their carnivore diets being so high in zinc caused copper depletion. And so the solution to the carnivore diet is copper, interestingly enough. Um, and vegans might get a, a, like a tiny bit more copper, but not very much, but they also, uh, sl absorb slightly less. So almost the entire food supply is, uh, devoid of copper, whether you're vegan or carnivore, there's really no good food, so food sources for copper except for liver. 
But yes, you're right. Carnivore diets can cause copper deficiency. Seen that again and again. Wow. And even liver, right? Because um, it blew my mind. Like I, I haven't stopped thinking about it for a day since Morley said this, that um, that far, uh, farmer down in Texas did a liver biopsy of his cattle and he found zero copper essentially in their livers. And they were looking to make a desiccated liver capsule product, which are super trending right now. And there is no copper wow. in that animal liver. And this was a healthy, this very healthy farm. And to me, that's wow. very scary because people are banking on these organ meats as being superior to, say, your copper sulfate solution that you recommend. They say that's synthetic, it's unnatural, it's isolated. Wouldn't find that in nature. It would be more natural to get it from liver. But I just question, is it even in liver? Like, can you rely on that? <laughs> that's wild. That's wild. I, I can't believe that myself. But I, I mean, I know. I mean, there's there are a lot of things out there like glyphosate that is chelating the copper in the soils. And so we're not the plants aren't getting it. And then the cows aren't getting it if they're eating, uh, you know, grass that has been contaminated with glyphosate. So they could be copper deficient animals. In fact, in my book, one of the statements that struck me the most was that um, copper deficiency is the number one nutritional problem in all of agricultural animals. So it's not just in humans and the fact that even our food supply is so low in copper, that explains why we're so low in copper. Um, but I want to address the comment that you just made that, yeah, people think that, uh, you know, copper sulfate isn't natural or whatever, but it's important to remember that copper sulfate is merely a salt. S-A-L-T, it's a salt. It's no different than table salt. Chemically, a salt is a salt. Um, if if copper sulfate is unnatural, then don't ever salt your food. You know, people think, oh, well, if it's organic and we can't we can't absorb or inorganic uh, minerals, well, that's nonsense. You know, iodine is inorganic. It's the inorganic form of iodine that's the safest kind of iodine. In fact. Um, and copper sulfate is super safe because it's totally purified and it's been removed from contaminants. When they form copper sulfate and it grows as a crystal, the crystallization growing process purifies the stuff so that it becomes literally pharmaceutical grade, 99% pure. It makes it pharma grade and food grade. So, you know, if you buy a... Uh, regular copper supplement that has all sorts of other binders in it, who knows what you're getting. But if you're buying copper sulfate and it's already 99% pure, purity is really where it's at. Yeah, that's a good point. And you brought up something interesting, the organic versus inorganic minerals, because that's been something I've been meditating on for, I don't know, seven years or so. And it's my understanding, like organic okay, minerals. Wow. <laughs> I mean, I'm not an expert by any means. I'm just a lay person. But it's my understanding that organic minerals are car are attached to carbon. So um, basically, they're bonded to carbon and inorganic minerals are not, which doesn't make one better than the other. Um, but I am a fan of shilajit. I sell the resin I import from Russia myself, and that contains fulvic acid, which the the plants use to uptake minerals. And so... That's part of my mitigation strategy if I go out and have a cheeseburger or whatever is I just take like a gram of shilajit to get fulvic acid and try to you know balance out um, the food ingredients that I'm eating that probably weren't grown properly, you know. So, um, but yeah, it's interesting with the copper sulfate. That, that's so, a solution for farmers. Uh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> it is. It's, it, farmers do use that as like a... a, a for their animals and for their crops and things like that. Uh, in fact, Bordeaux mixture is uh, used applied on grapes in France. It's copper sulfate mixed with like a, a calcium. Um, it, it's used as a pesticide and prevents people from eat, eating their grapes because it they taste sour on the outside of the skin or whatever. And it ends up in the wines and kind of explains the French diet uh, paradox why they eat high fat diets and yet at the same time they're healthy and don't get heart disease because the copper prevents heart disease. So that's an interesting connection there. Um, you did mention, so uh, if there's a carbon atom, it's an organic. So if you look up malachite, uh, malachite is, co is copper attached to a carbon atom. And it one of the historic uses or, or sources for, for copper was crushed and powdered malachite. 
Cleopatra is known to have used crushed and powdered malachite for her eyeshadow, of all things. You know, it would probably also reduce some puffiness. As you wow. know, copper is great for the skin. Yeah, that's incredible. I, yeah. I, since our interview, I, I got some malachite, um, and uh, I'm thinking I might no. put it on my walls and my and my bathroom since I'm doing a lot of cool stuff in my, my bathroom area. <laughs> Just like oh, make a copper man. room, you know? <laughs> No, that would be luxurious and beautiful. <laughs> it's, it's yeah, minerals are are, are fascinating. Um, how they all have amazing, you know, amazing. different crystals have different minerals. But yeah, so so back to zinc. Um, we could talk about copper all day, which is which is fascinating and I know, they're right? connected, right? <laughs> um, one thing yeah, I a burning, yeah. burning burning question I had for you is like, and I and I asked this question in your group, um, and it's a confusing one, but the the ratio, like I went down this rabbit hole of just looking at PubMed studies of the the zinc copper ratio, and I think I posted a few in your group, and it was basically saying that the ideal was a one to one, you know, when they're looking, I guess, in the blood, right? Which we already said is not a right. complete picture, um, but just right. seeing how that translates to, I think, what you said is uh, when you supplement, the ratio should be like what, no more than a 15 zinc to one part copper, which is really different from the one to one. So I'm just wondering where, like, wouldn't the supplement have to be one to one to to create that one to one ratio in our body? I'm just kind of wrapping my head around that. <laughs> I think that's a very great question. So I have tried also to figure out the answer to that question for years. And it was only recently that I had heard that the, the person who originated the 15 to 1 ratio, uh, I guess, was uh, Carl Pfeiffer. And he was an anti-copper advocate, an advocate of copper toxicity. Um, but he did recognize, I guess, that, you know, we do need some copper. Um, and I guess he recognized that zinc could deplete copper. And I guess at the 15 to 1 ratio, I, I've tried to look for the rationale for that ratio that we see everywhere. And the, the only best rationale that I can find is that um, if you don't take any copper, it's a huge problem. And that the if you take some copper, the 15 to 1 ratio might be enough to mitigate the zinc uh, inducing a copper deficiency. In other words, that is the upper limit of an appropriate ratio. And if you go above that, you're going to be in trouble. So 20 to 1, you're going to probably be in copper deficiency. And in fact, what we found, I think we mentioned this on the first show, is that a, a woman ate uh, five years of nothing about oysters and developed copper deficiency. And I looked into it. And the oysters have a ratio of about 15 to 18 to 1 zinc over copper. They also have a bunch of other toxins, which makes them a non-kosher food because they're bottom dwellers. And I don't like oysters for that reason. I also don't like liver because liver is just disgusting. But <laughs> um, that indicates that that's a very bad rationale, okay, that basically uh, that would be an absolute minimum for copper. It doesn't speak to what would be an ideal amount of copper, which, of course, would be an entirely different ratio. So some people have said, well, the 15 to 1 ratio was bad. We've recognized it as bad, so therefore an 8 to 1 is better. Okay, well, that's a good first step in recognizing that the 15 to 1 ratio is bad and can pretty much lead to copper deficiency, and it doesn't really solve the problem. So, But why did they only go to 8 to 1? There's no specific rationale there either. And the only rationale that I can find is that because people are still – by and large, terrified of copper toxicity, and they don't know a thing about copper. So the amounts that I was taking, I actually inverted the ratio, and I went all the way, you know, 100 milligrams of copper and only 10 milligrams of zinc. And I discovered that, no, I, a few months after a few months of that, and I did that on purpose when I was writing the book, as I was finishing up the book, because I wanted to figure out, I wanted to A, maximize copper. I didn't want the zinc to hurt it, but I led. The, I realized that that led to some symptoms of zinc deficiency. So I bumped up the zinc to about 25 milligrams. That solved some of my own zinc deficiency problems like low libido uh, and some, uh, but I still had that uh, dry skin problem. I bumped it up again to 50 milligrams um, and uh, I was having some sneezing. And I'm like, it must be springtime allergies. And I, then I bumped it up to about 100 milligrams of zinc and all of the allergies went away immediately. And I was like, oh, I'm so much better. I'm no longer allergic. And I realized, yes, you know, these allergies, we're all, we're all told, oh, well, I'm not an allergy person. That's my brother's problem. So I'm, 
it's not me. But look, if we're sneezing and we're having a runny nose, that's allergies. You don't have to wait for a diagnosis from a doctor, and it doesn't take a rocket science to know that you're sneezing and you're having a runny nose problem. If you're sneezing and you're having a runny nose problem, that's really a problem of low zinc. Take the zinc, you'll feel better almost immediately. Yeah, and that's, that's incredible. I grew up sneezing my, like I was a very sick child. I mean, my parents did best they could, like all of our parents, but I just remember being severely allergic to dust where I would just sneeze for, you know, 10 minutes if I had one whiff of, of dust, you know, if there, people were cleaning the house or whatever my parents were. And um, I was probably zinc deficient my whole life. I mean, that's been what I've been thinking about the last several months is, you know, what nutrients were, was I not getting for the first like three decades of my life? It was probably multiple things. <laughs> right, right. You know, it's interesting you say this, um, you know, allergies uh, were a problem for me about, oh, maybe 15 years ago. And I, I was in the precious metal newsletter writing business and uh, another precious metal newsletter writer, he said, Jason, you got to look into chelation. Chelation's where it's at. Chelators, they can, you know, reverse heart disease and pull the calcium out. And uh, I had heart disease and we can get the word out about chelation. You have to get the word out. So I, I tried some chelation and sure enough, it helped my allergies because chelators, and this is a very interesting topic, chelators remove a lot of toxins, but they also unfortunately remove a lot of our good uh, micro minerals like copper and zinc. So what's the interesting thing is that the problem of chelators is actually a, the solution because copper itself is probably the best natural chelator out there. People know that chelation should be working. They know that it's a problem because it eliminates minerals. Minerals are the best chelators. Copper creates so many different detoxifying enzymes and so does zinc because zinc makes the metallothionine, metallothionine, which is a chelator of all the other toxins. So all these autistic kids or have mercury problems or whatever, it's zinc and copper are, are the solution. But mm, part of the problem is in copper deficiency, they test high with copper in the blood. So they all think they're copper toxic, which is leading them away from the exact solution. So there's just this learning curve of getting past this um, counterintuitive nature that copper can be high in the blood during copper deficiency that is the key factor and the hardest thing to understand. Mm. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up chelation because the, the whole detox thing is still, you know, trending and people are always looking for the latest and greatest supplement to um, chelate their heavy metals out and do a heavy metal detox, right? But um, you could just search zinc cadmium and there's tons of studies showing how zinc actually will chelate cadmium and same thing with with magnesium and copper, right? They all chelate different heavy metals out of your body. It's like, we don't need to micromanage and like, you know, take, take these crazy supplements to try to like get it out. Um, just, you know, fulfilling our mineral needs, right? will allow our body to naturally excrete these heavy metals that are just coming in every which way. Well, the other thing is that, uh, you know, the, the copper toxic advocates, they recommend uh, zinc and vitamin C in order to lower copper, and they get pretty good results. Why? Because zinc is an excellent, excellent mineral, that's why. And so is vitamin C. You know, it, both of those are also very strong detoxifiers. And if you're detoxifying all these toxins that are creating all of the problems, you're going to get significantly better. Um it's the drawback of them failing to acknowledge that they need a lot of copper too as an additional detoxifier. They would get even better results because they're all just mis misled by the high copper in the blood problem. Mm, interesting. Yeah, I'm glad you shared your story about high dose and copper without the zinc because I, I think you did it longer than me, but I did that for, I don't know, maybe two or three weeks. And, uh, I guess I could share the story here because I haven't said it on my show. Yeah, the it. first time I, I experimented yeah. with high dose uh, copper was mid interview with a frequent guest, Adam Bergstrom that I've had on the show multiple times. And we were two hours into the interview and you know, that's a long time. So I felt like I was starting to hit a wall. So I, so I grabbed my copper sulfate here on my desk and just started rubbing it on my hands as I was listening to him and talking with him. And I think I ended up rubbing on like 15 dropper fulls within like 10 minutes. I just kept rubbing it on my hands. And 
this wow, nausea okay. kicked in. Like <laughs> pick, pick me up. <laughs> okay, right. Nausea. I was just like, I want to see if this works, you know, and uh, I started to feel this like nausea, which I never get with anything ever. And it, it only lasts like 45 minutes or so. And I just push through it. You know, I just keep the interview going. And when we get to the three hour mark, I just get this second wind and this boost. And I just felt like I could go another three hours. It's like, okay, wow. This, oh, right. Something... When the copper kicked in. Right, right. right. The nausea. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's, and, that's uh, great. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think I was applying about that amount. Um, cause I'm a relatively healthy guy. Like I think I could experiment pretty safely. I don't, you know, recommend it to people, you know, on the internet off the bat. I say just, this is what I'm doing, not recommending it. And I was, it's very clear with that. Um, but what I noticed, like you said, the symptoms, I noticed dry skin, like my hands are very dry and my sleep quality was going down. Um, and maybe libido too. And yeah, then when, when I added in zinc, it just felt like I was myself again. It's like, oh, wow, this is excellent. Yeah, that, that's great. So uh, there's a guy in my forum who just today mentioned, um, you know, the copper nausea problem. He said, uh, well, I took a zinc the night before and then I tried to take copper in the morning in a way that would make him give me nausea. And he said, I had no nausea at all. So it could very well be that the nausea problem is a low zinc problem. Interesting. Yeah. I'm, I'm really curious what the upper, the upper limit with zinc. Uh, this morning I read in some biohacking group, uh, they were, they showed a picture of Dave Asprey and they were saying, you look so old. And, and someone commented that, you know, he's like big biohacker guy, anti-aging wants to live to like 150 or something. And someone commented and said that he recently made a comment that he thinks his hair went gray from high dosing zinc, <laughs> but he he, maybe, did. right? Cause it's, it's the balance, yeah. right? Cause if you have both zinc and copper coming in, it, in the right balance, your hair is not going to go gray and it could, could reverse actually. Right. Even with zinc coming in, but if all you have is zinc coming in, then, you're going to have and that that's going to induce peroxide. a copper deficiency and your, your hair is going to go gray. That's right. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny when you start so to stop I, talking about the vanity stuff. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so the interesting thing happened to me um, about two weeks ago. A doctor called me up out of the blue and he thanked me so much for writing my book on copper. And, uh, and we went over several issues that we've already talked about just now. And then he said, well, Jason, I'm good friends with Walsh of the Walsh Institute who believes in and teaches this copper toxicity. And um, how can I, you know, talk to him about it? And why is it that he's getting such great results with zinc and, you know, vitamin C? And what do you know about that? And so we went over things and the gray hair and stuff. And, and he's like, well, it's interesting you mentioned that because um, Walsh is like has completely white hair. And his face is very wrinkled, but he's old and in good health. So, you know, I mean, you know, once again, zinc is great and cop and, you know, vitamin C is great. And maybe he's holding his copper deficiency at bay because, you know, with zinc and vitamin C, you're able to make quite a bit of collagen. Those are, you know, three, two of the three big cofactors for collagen formation, but he still needs his copper and he's probably induced a copper deficiency into himself because of his bias. So, uh, but managed to stay healthy. It's very, very interesting. Yeah. I, I bet most humans on the planet have some chronic deficiency that just goes unnoticed for their entire life, right? Or multiple. I mean, it has to. <laughs> I, I, I was in so many deficiencies back in my days when I was drinking alcohol. But, you know, I've been sober 10 years now. So, yeah, I'm doing pretty good. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. And uh, I guess I want to make this point, too, like the the food only people versus uh, like there's, there's kind of like a camp that just says, you know, you're going to imbalance the body if you take supplements, uh, especially isolates. And so don't overcomplicate life, just eat whole foods. But I mentioned earlier, right? The potential uh, uh, liver problem, the, the, the beef liver being, def being devoid of copper. And I think, People just don't realize, I mean, you mentioned glyphosate, but there's NPK fertilizer, there's acid rain, there's bio sludge, which they're dumping on farms. 
they're watering it with chemicalized tap water <laughs> and this our 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 whole foods are not good enough and that's very triggering for a lot of people right i mean they're still we have to eat they're still worth eating you know there's better ones than others but you will induce deficiencies over time if all you eat is whole foods right and you take no supplements I, I agree with you, but, you know, our food supply only gives us about 0.6 milligrams of copper or less for the average person. That's 80% of people. And that was a few years ago when they did that study. And it's been going down and down ever for quite a long time. You have to go back about 60 years and most people got five milligrams of copper, which is now nearly, you know, a thousand percent more our recent ancestors who fought in World War II. People are like, well, we're different people today. I don't know if we could really even fight a World War II. Like, I mean, think of, you know, our our younger generation who are called, what are they called? The, um, okay, let's not insult them. So I don't want to say that, but they're called snowflakes, right? And yet our older generation who are now dying off, who fought in World War II, they stormed the beaches in Normandy when they were under fire. I mean, how badass is that? Every single one of those guys was equivalent of like a Rambo that we don't, that only doesn't even exist anymore. I mean, it's just, it's crazy the changes, right? And so we need copper and zinc for testosterone production. And we just flat out don't have that. It explains the snowflakes and soy boys really clearly. I mean, these are big problems, societal problems. So people who would think, look, I'd love to live in the ideal world where I wouldn't have to supplement, but we don't live in an ideal world. We live in a very artificial world. Uh, you know, we're, I'm surrounded by bromine in the carpets and in the uh, bread supply and in the couches and in pajamas. We get fluoride exposure everywhere, even when we try to avoid it. Fluoride's in uh, grapes, it's in all dried fruits, it's in uh, Gore-Tex and Teflon pans. If you go to eat out and they cooked your food in a Teflon pan that you didn't know about, you're getting fluoride. If you drink water in a restaurant and you're traveling, you're getting fluoride. You just can't, I mean, they've said babies, babies in the womb, freshly born, have a whopping 600 different toxins in their blood, uh, known toxins that have been you know, categorized and they know are toxic. Um, you know, again, what was the thing I mentioned time and time again on our first show, we have like the average person has five substances in their body that all deplete copper. And then we all have them in our body at levels above copper. We are not in a natural world and try to getting things naturally is just colossally stupid at this point. I mean, what is the whole environmental movement about? Because we know that there's toxins in the environment and, uh, and people are so stupid that in California, they're banning straws rather than banning fluoride from the water. The Democrats who've gained power appear to be the most copper deficient. Let's put it that way. <laughs> you just blew my mind with the, the Gore-Tex piece. I, for a short time, I was folding clothes. I worked at a the clothing department at a sporting goods store before I moved to the scuba department. And you know all the snowboarding, skiing outfits, you know the high-end ones, $500 jackets, it was like Gore-Tex. And uh, you just said there's fluoride. Well, that's right. Made that's it's all fluoride. That's wild. <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, if you just it's, yeah, it's just it's one big string of fluoride molecules on there. I can't believe that that stuff is even allowed to be used. And it's the same stuff that's used to make Gore-Tex fluoride. It's in Glide dental floss. And there's a study in my copper book that shows that Glide dental floss is linked to lower IQ and brain problems. Wow. And the only way to <laughs> like deal with that is to take inorganic iodine and inorganic boron and copper in large enough amounts to detox this stuff. Because the average person, and there are people above average and there's people below average, but the average person has 2,600 milligrams of fluoride in their bodies. And the average person is just on the verge of having skeletal fluorosis. The average person is on the verge of having skeletal fluorosis. That means if our society doesn't change things, the majority of the people will soon be quickly having skeletal fluorosis if we don't change something. That's wild to me, but that's where we're at. That is crazy. Yeah. Yeah, you got me interested in the iodine because I was taking that for several years, uh, years ago, and I stopped because um, I got caught up in some, some fear articles about it, shutting down the thyroid or something. Um, but I, I like the nascent iodine and I've been experimenting with 
you know, 10 milligrams of boron a day, which I think you do 50 in a day, which I haven't gotten I do, up to that I do level up to yet. 100, yeah. Wow. Yes, I do 100 milligrams of iodine, 100 milligrams of boron, 100 milligrams of zinc, 100 milligrams of copper. That's a good ratio. 100 milligrams of everything. <laughs> well, what form of boron are you doing? Because I know the boron bisglycinate can get pretty pricey, right? So the cheapest is borax, 20 mule team. It's a, just a box. It's about four bucks. It will last you a lifetime. I typically take an eighth of a teaspoon of that in each of two morning coffees, and an eighth of a teaspoon has about 50 milligrams. One full teaspoon has a whopping um, just over 400 milligrams. A heaping teaspoon has about 600 milligrams, so if it's like piled high. Oh, yeah. I've, I think I've taken that orally a few times, but I mostly put that in my bath. That's that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, and, and earlier to the, the doom and gloom, uh, just to give some some light to what we were saying, I think, you know, the, the the idea to me is to have more farmers, people that are doing it right. Like, it's not about spraying copper on the soil. It's about, um, like, putting it in the seeds. Like, so I think it's like soaking or spraying the seeds with copper sulfate solution. And not I, not many farmers are, are doing that. Um, so th I'm putting up a growing dome here, like a little biodome <laughs> here in, in North Idaho this, this year. And my, my idea is just to, to be the example, just to show like, yes, even though I'm supplementing, we should be moving in some direction, you know, ideally where we're creating nutrient dense foods that actually have copper, um, you know, when we're living in a copper desert, desert world, we need to. You know, what's Start interesting, the, the copper toxicity people, they warn that too many farmers are using uh, oh, copper right. sulfate as a as an additive, an unnatural additive that's poisoning us all, um, which is just, again, wild to me. Uh, not very many of them are, as you know. Uh, yeah, it's wild. Um, I mean, there's so much to talk about with uh, with zinc. Um I want to mention that one thing before it gets away from me, and that is some zinc actually helps us absorb copper. So we found they found that with like um, almost no zinc, um, less copper was was absorbed. At 13 milligrams of zinc, more copper was absorbed, or the most. And then again, high levels of zinc, there's that uh, counterbalancing low copper effect. And this was only on people taking the average of say 0 0.6 or maybe it was uh, sorry 1.2 milligrams of copper as a supplement. Um, we have absolutely no idea what the exact amount of peak absorption would be if we were taking like the heaping amounts of copper that we're taking, like 20 to 30 milligrams. It could be an entirely different number. We really don't know. We should just experiment. <laughs> I love it. Jason, have you looked into the half-lives of copper and zinc, uh, like the timing? Because um, I, I thought I read yes. that the copper is like, what, 20 hours? or it's, it's, It was pretty long. I think the half-life of copper in the body is 22 days. Oh, wow. But most copper is metabolized within about two hours. And then um, even though the half-life is 22 days, the reality is, is like, so they do these studies over the course of a month or two. And what they found was that in the first week, there was a lot of copper absorption. And then by like week four, uh, copper excretion dramatically increased because it takes a while for the metallothionine enzymes to build up and other copper excretion enzymes to build up. Then the body gets very good and it sort of catches up to the initial input of copper and then almost all the copper gets excreted. So within 30 days, the body is, is excreting 90% or more uh, of the copper that's being taken in, which is again another great example of why copper can't be toxic because we learn to excrete it fast. It's almost like taking copper, we learn not only to excrete the copper, but we learn to excrete all the other poisons. Does that also apply for zinc, Jason? Like if you if you make it out zinc, like we talked about at the start, uh, will you excrete a lot of it? So. I haven't seen anybody complain about zinc building up in the body, which is very interesting, like they do with copper. And I think copper only builds up in the body because copper gets attracted to other poisons. And so it, that really only happens in copper deficiency, that copper is building up because we need enough copper to detoxify the other poisons. Otherwise, the copper will be attracted to the poisons and stay there.
So since nobody's complaining about zinc building up, I think it, the body probably just excretes it just fine. I was looking at, like because you had told me you took 300 milligrams of zinc, I was looking and I I had read that you know over 150 milligrams and the 300 milligrams of zinc causes problems. So I wanted to see what those problems were, and it was very interesting. They said that pretty much the only problem is that it will deplete copper. That's the problem. And then they said that, and then here's the funny thing. Here's the funny thing. Then they said, and there's no antidote. Well, wouldn't the antidote <laughs> be to just take the copper? It's so funny. It's so funny. They they can't even figure that one out. That's hilarious. Wow. Yeah, because if you I do know, the math, right? would it be 300 divided by, it's been a while since I've taught math, but 300 divided by 15, 20, wouldn't technically, if we're going on a 15 oh, to 1 ratio, you, you'd only need 20 milligrams of copper to balance out 300 milligrams of zinc. <laughs> and that would be if the 15 to 1 worked, you'd probably need to take about 40 milligrams of copper for a little while. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are, are you uh are you also taking selenium uh because you mentioned you're taking pretty much everything right yeah so uh funny thing is i haven't really started taking a high dose of selenium because selenium is a little bit expensive so i just take the standard 200 micrograms um i have read though that selenium toxicity will kick in at levels 200 times higher than that where a supplement manufacturer one time accidentally released a batch of selenium that was 200 times stronger than it should have been and that's when people develop toxicity symptoms. I don't think anybody died. Um, so selenium appears to be very safe up to that 40 milligram range, but I think it's just very expensive. So, you know, you know me, I like the cheaper supplements. <laughs> yeah, we need like a, a 20 mule team style of selenium. I wonder what that is. <laughs> exactly, right? Yes. <laughs> Um, is there anything else you want to, I think you have a bunch of notes there, right, Jason? Any other subjects on on the topic of zinc that you want to There are a couple of things I wanted to uh, mention, and that is, first of all, zinc helps us make a retinol binding protein. So zinc is actually the solution for uh, vitamin A toxicity. And um, I looked into this whole vitamin A toxicity thing. I don't think it probably affects you because you're too young. But uh, vitamin A can be bioaccumulative, and if it, the theory goes that if the liver gets over full of vitamin A, it then gets stored in the fat tissues. And if the fat tissues then get over full of vitamin A, it starts coming out in the skin. And as, an, as a retinolic acid or as an acid, it starts causing things like rashes in the skin. And we were getting these really tiny little rashes, uh, Jennifer and me and my wife. And so we decided to test the low vitamin A diet. And so we just had a lot of beans and rice, Mexican food, right? Um, and sure enough, all of our rashes immediately stopped. And we're like, oh, really? So our problem is because we eat out a lot, we try to eat healthy and we're health nuts. We're like, oh, sweet potato. Yay, more vitamin A. But it's in the safe form because it's beta carotene. No problem. Yay. But it turns out that if, theoretically, all of the beta carotene can get converted into retinoic acid because the beta carotene actually gets converted very easily in the presence of copper. And a beta carotene is really two retinoic acids bound together. So if it all gets processed, maybe we're overloading ourselves. And um, so it's interesting that zinc is a um, great for rashes, and it binds to retinoic acid, which can cause rashes. So it's a very interesting link there. I mean, zinc is an antihistamine, but antihistamines, where are they released? They're released only in response to toxins. But zinc also eliminates the toxins. So there's a lot of rea uh, interrelations there. Yeah, and, and uh, also acne, right? Like a lot of skin issues. Because I, I had a, uh, it wasn't really severe acne, but it was maybe on a scale, you know, one to 10, it was like a six or seven. It was, uh, you know, I had like a, a pimple on my face every single week, which was um, embarrassing and annoying. But that, from from what I've seen, a lot of skin issues are caused by vitamin A deficiency, zinc deficiency. deficiency. Um, maybe, maybe copper plays a role there, but I know vitamin A and zinc for sure are uh, have been used. You know, they have Accutane, right? Synthetic uh, synthetic right. A. It's a synthetic acne, vitamin which is, A is for the good. skin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Right, right. So one of the things that we have, my wife has read was that acne is largely a problem of fluoride. And that once you go through the fluoride detox, it's no longer a problem. And what happened to me in my uh, mid-40s, I've never had acne on my back. But I developed this huge, huge acne in my upper back 
area. And it turns out that I was cons over consuming a lot of fluoride foods and Jennifer clued me in. I was eating a lot of chicken and it had a lot of fluoride. I was eating a lot of dried fruits. It has fluoride, uh, especially raisins, which are grapes, which are have, have a lot of fluoride um, and uh, eating a lot of grapes and um, uh, cherries, which are sprayed with fluoride because they don't want them to rot. So I, had, I was eating a lot of foods with fluoride in them and uh, that could have been responsible for me for developing back acne in my mid 40s of all. And so the first thing that I did was uh, I started consuming um, uh, potassium iodide because it's a much stronger form of iodine than just Lugol's solution. And I was able to get my uh, um, iodine consumption up to 2000 milligrams a day, which I did every day for about a year with Jennifer. And uh, my first month on that and all my acne problems, almost all of it completely went away because it's, it detoxes fluoride. Wow. And also I was doing um, the boron and the copper at the same time. So because I was doing several things at once to detox fluoride, all the acne problems went away. Wow. You say 2000, was it milligrams or micrograms? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I know milligrams, not a typo, oh, wow. not a verbal wow. typo. Thank you for correcting me. <laughs> so Lugol's, you can only go up to about 100, 200, 300 milligrams and it starts to like be real, um, uh, acidic and burns your eyeballs and things like that. So potassium iodide is a little bit softer and easier and gentler, and you can use that form to go up to 2,000 milligrams of iodine. But it's in the form of the iodide, which is because it's bound to the potassium, it's a little bit gentler on the system. Yeah, I saw the post of your your wife, Jennifer. You, you guys painted her, you said, head to toe in uh, Lou Gold's iodine one day, right? <laughs> that, that was, yeah, we did that a long time ago. So that was Lou Gold's. And uh, she actually developed a weird depression from that, which we solved with copper. And so then that kind of led me to think, well, why in the world was she depressed? Because iodine does not cause depression, but fluoride does. So did we stir up a ton of fluoride? Because we knew that was her, her, one of her problems um, from taking Prozac, which is a fluoride. And um, copper fixed it right away. Uh, the other great thing about zinc that I wanted to mention was that zinc, get this, just like copper, lowers iron. So there's two reasons why we no longer have to worry about, uh, say, giving blood to lower our iron. Both zinc and copper will do it. Interesting. Yeah, I just gave blood. I'm I'm gonna keep experimenting with it just because it feels good. But uh, I've been I just had my second one done. Uh, you know, two months apart, and um, I didn't feel as energized as the first one. It was interesting, but that's uh, I didn't I didn't eat a full meal before. I think that played a role. I didn't get a full night's sleep before the donation, <laughs> but uh, it does seem like a nice tonic to the body as Morley calls it to donate blood. Um, yeah. When, when's the last time you've donated Jason? I'm just curious. <laughs> All right. So I have a type two bleeding disorder. And so I think I've been identified as one of those people who can't give blood. So I, and as a bleeder, <laughs> right, I've been fighting my whole life to hold on to the blood that I have. So I'm not really so keen on wanting to give blood. Um, I'm just glad that I haven't had any nosebleeds in the last four years. Um, I want to tell you one more thing about zinc that it did for me lately, and that is this. It helped me, has, it helps help me gain about 11 pounds. I've always considered myself a hard gainer in the gym. You know, I go to the gym and I lift and I expect to grow and growth never happens. And I'm just always stuck at 222 pounds. And the reason why I get stuck is because I start developing allergies. Uh, I get over full in my stomach, digestion suffers. Uh, I don't feel like I can eat any more food. So how can I gain weight if I can't eat any more food? I go to sleep and my nose is all congested or I get allergies and I feel congested in my stomach and in my nose. And I'm telling people because I'm writing, you know, I'm in the forum and talking about copper all day long and how people need to also take zinc and zinc is great for allergies. I finally put two and two together. Oh, this is allergies I'm having. So this is a histamine reaction I'm having. So let me just if I just take more zinc and that keep my nose clear and it will improve my digestion, does this mean I can gain weight without this problem happening now that I know the solution? So I've been taking more zinc and taking more, more vitamin C. And so very quickly, I was able to gain weight without having all of these problems that were developing every single time I was trying to gain weight. Now, yes, a lot of this food is probably in my belly and I'm probably a little bit more fat than I should be. However, I don't have the symptoms that fat man has of the congested nose and difficult allergy problems 
and I'm suddenly getting rapidly stronger in the gym. And that's the big thing. That's awesome. Wow. I, it's interesting you brought up um, digestion because that's one thing that shocked me about zinc deficiency. Um, like I have a, a study here from the University of Munich 2016 that just a minimal zinc deficiency impairs digestion, which is fascinating. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> that is interesting. So what the, one of the things we need zinc for is to make hydrochloric acid. And hydrochloric acid is basically our main digestive juice. So that's why that's important. Um, but zinc is also a key factor in making collagen along with copper and vitamin C. So this trio of zinc, copper, and vitamin C making collagen, well, what are we trying to do when we go to the gym and build muscle? Muscle is 30% collagen. You know, collagen is what gives the strength to our, our fibers in our system. Um, in fact, I was looking up uh, bones for the, the copper book because I was thinking bones were mostly all calcium. The number one ingredient in bone is collagen. It's 35% collagen. It's not calcium. And the calcium has to go deposited into the bone into somewhere, and it gets deposited into the collagen matrix that has to be there first. So we really need zinc and copper and vitamin C for our bones first before we need calcium. Yeah, I think I read in the, the book, The Calcium Lie, he listed like 12 minerals uh, that are a part of bone, and one of which was calcium, but it was like copper, zinc, magnesium, I think boron might have been in there. Like it was a pretty significant it's list. You know, people group. think just for, yeah, just dairy for their bones and they're good, but it's like maybe partly, right. but other and In fact, <laughs> if, you just take, if you just take a ton of calcium, and because calcium gets significantly overconsumed, Calcium ends up blocking all the other minerals. It, it will start blocking uh, the magnesium, and you need the magnesium to keep the calcium in solution. So what happens if you, if you just take calcium? It doesn't even go into the bones because it needs all these other cofactors to get into the bones. And since it depletes all the other cofactors, calcium ends up precipitating out in the blood supply and creating things like arthritis, stiffening the joints, and it creates uh, arterial sclerosis, and it creates kidney stones, all sorts of problems just from taking calcium supplements. So most people in the alternative health community say no to taking calcium supplements, but there's a lot more we really need to do. We need to take all these micro minerals, zinc and copper, man, that's where it's at. Yeah. And I think we're on the same page with, with not um, supplementing zinc and, uh, and vitamin D too, right? Which vitamin D increases calcium absorption. <laughs> so that's right. I mean, uh, I don't take uh, vitamin D, but I do try to get out in the sun and I will artificially tan in the winter. Uh, if I can't uh, take the time to sun and during the summertime. And what, one other thing I found fascinating, Jason, is you, you don't, you said you don't supplement magnesium because your, uh, your theory is that you're retaining it with, uh, what is it? Copper and boron. I think that's right. Well, I've, I've taken, so I've taken magnesium because of the calcium problem pretty much for, I don't know, six, six or more years. So at this point, I mean, at some point I have to be full of it. Right. Right. So, um, we decided to go ahead and temporarily stop the magnesium and see how we felt. I was expecting I would develop some sort of uh, muscle cramps or something, and it never happened. Um, and I don't really crave magnesium, maybe. And there are problems with taking too much magnesium. It can deplete B1. And when people get depleted of B1 from magnesium, they can develop racing heart. And racing heart is a very common symptom and problem out there among people who are taking all the supplements to try to get healthy, and it could very well be from too much magnesium. So it does not mean that I don't think magnesium is good. I think I don't have a problem retaining it because I've got the copper and the boron. And, you know, magnesium is in the food supply. Copper, uh, calcium is in the food supply. Uh, you know, I, I eat milk and um, eat greens and grains and meat. I have a very wide variety diet. So... I'm getting magnesium. Um, you know, I don't dispute that magnesium is used for 3,000 processes, but if I'm not copper deficient and I'm not boron deficient, I probably don't have a magnesium wasting problem, and therefore I probably don't need to supplement it. You know, I think we really need to supplement these minerals that help us detoxify. Again, magnesium is still a great detoxifier. Um, I, maybe I just don't need it. So uh, I've decided to try to live without it. And, uh, we, we might go back and try some magnesium once a week just to be on the safe side, but uh, um, I'm surprised that, that I haven't developed any symptoms that I could pinpoint at all from not taking magnesium. Yeah, I would I'm have a, expected a, at least some symptoms. 
That is interesting. Yeah, on the affordability side, um, the the most inexpensive magnesium because it's all magnesium is I think one of the most expensive <laughs> um, uh, minerals to to supplement. But the the cheapest one is making your own magnesium bicarbonate, and I've been you know showing people how to do that for I don't know six years, and it's basically just magnesium hydroxide powder uh, mixed with cold soda water, so carbonated water. And the reaction makes magnesium bicarbonate. So it's that liquid form. I think it's 50% absorption. And you just do shots in between meals, um, which that can create loose stools. I mean, when I was going too heavy on it, I was drinking a whole mason jar, 32 ounces. And that gave me diarrhea for days. <laughs> you know, so you have to, you have to wow. like split it up. I'm so amazed yourself. you say that. I, the next thing I was going to say, and this is like one of the last things on my list, is that bicarbonate uses up zinc oh wow so and one of the <laughs> symptoms of zinc deficiency is diarrhea <laughs> it's all connected yes. <laughs> it's all connected that's right that's right you know i that's i thought the show was going to be a lot more boring because zinc is such a mainstream nutrient you know you go to the supermarket grocery stores and you look at the minerals there's a zinc this zinc that just zinc is everywhere you won't find copper anywhere so do people really need to be encouraged to take zinc? You know, if they're on the high copper program, they certainly do need to be encouraged because um, there are voices out there discouraging us from taking zinc with copper. But I think zinc is important to take with copper. Yeah. And I even wonder for someone like me that that was vegan vegetarian for almost a decade. Um, and most of my childhood, I didn't like steak or ground beef. I was like a, ch you know, chicken nuggets kid. And fish, I, I didn't like red meat for the first uh, almost 30 years of my life. Um, and so I wonder wow. how much zinc I was getting for most of my life. It was probably very minimal. You can get some zinc from beans, but if, if, if you're not eating any beans, then your zinc is going to be pretty low. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fortunately, I was eating a lot of bean burritos. I'd go out to, <laughs> to have Mexican food with my friends and just get a veggie burrito and living on those <laughs> probably had other issues though it's in that kidding. thing <laughs> you know what's really interesting is that, that vegans do suffer from zinc deficiency pretty typically the zinc deficiency and b12 and one of the signs of that's associated with veganism is an anxiety problem and zinc deficiency also creates an anxiety problem as well as a, a lack of joy problem um it affects our emotions significantly. So uh, I don't know if you experienced that when you were, were a vegan or not. You tell us. Did you have like a anxiety problem when you were a vegan at all? Yeah. Sorry, Jason. You were breaking up for a little bit. I think the connection's good now. I, um, but I heard your question. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I definitely did. I had, I was, uh, you know, somewhat antisocial. I never imagined having a podcast or like, you know, I had to take public speaking classes and and college and, uh, you know, do more presentations. And it took me longer than most to, uh, you know, break out of my bubble and be able to communicate with other people. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd imagine that was largely a zinc deficiency and it's probably linked with testosterone too, right? Because I felt like as my testosterone went up, so did my ability to communicate with other people. <laughs> It's amazing how it all ties together because, right, testosterone gives us the boldness that makes anxiety melt away. So it's very interesting that those two are related as signs and symptoms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, you were saying you were trying a bunch of different diff different forms of zinc and you didn't really notice a difference. Like you tried uh, gummies and um, I know there's I what, the colonate. I didn't try the zinc picolinate. I didn't try zinc picolinate. I guess that's been identified as one that's not as well absorbed. But yeah, I, I do a zinc glycinate and uh, quite a bit, uh, quite a few different brands. We're not very brand loyal. We just try to buy, you know, supplements that are common and cheap, actually. Yeah, because that's the main question I, I got from people for this episode. What brand? What supplement? And they're, they're just looking for a, a link. And uh, people capitalize on that. I, you know, I always assess people's financials and i'm like you know if there's priorities here like you know i worked three jobs for years and was scraping by and barely making rent and i i get it if you're in that place it's like yeah 20 mule team borax making your own magnesium bicarbonate you know um 
copper sulfate. It, it These adds are up. Very cheap yeah. supplement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. It adds up, so you got to be cost conscious. Um, I think probably one of the most expensive supplements we're taking is the MSM sulfur. It's about uh, twenty dollars or thirty dollars that we go through almost every month. So the zinc that we buy, I mean, people are like, well, can I learn how to make the zinc by myself? You know, can I make zinc sulfate? You can. You can just do the math and see what percentage of zinc sulfate is zinc and make it and dilute it into the dropper bottle just as you do the uh, copper sulfate. But I haven't found it necessary to do that because the pills are convenient. And, you know, a bottle of 250 pills of zinc is like $14 and it lasts me, me and my wife easily four months. So. That's it's not really cost prohibitive to buy zinc at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one thing I'm still diving into is all the gummies uh, are the form of zinc citrate, from what I found. And you know, Morley's very anti citrate because of its you know effect on ceruloplasmin, um, as well as ascorbic acid. But it, I know that that CP slash ceruloplasmin can get too high, so I've been diving into that very heavily the last two months. And it's always a balance with everything, right? We don't want maximum as much as we possibly can get atp because that could cause problems we don't want maximum as high as we can get at ceruloplasmin right it's all in in a balance and even the activity level of ceruloplasmin that needs to be in balance everything's in a range right we don't just want sky high everything and so my point is <laughs> uh you know even if citrate has an effect on ceruloplasmin i'm wondering if it's if it's a balancing effect um but that yeah, that citrate compound is is is, is interesting. Um, have you have you delved into that at all? Like the I asked that Morley thing? that question: the difference between citrate and citric acid, and he said, "No, those are two different things." But you know, I think they're both found in an orange. So I think he's more against artificially made citrate, which is probably made via a fungal growth process in the manufacturing of it. Got it. Do you want to go through some of these questions that we have, uh, Jason? We have some good ones. There's one last point yeah. I want to make about zinc, and uh, yeah. it's sort of a dual point. Uh, it's very commonly known that zinc is good as a germ killer, and so, of course, is copper. And over the course of this interview, we've gone over all these different things that zinc does. It has a lot of overlap with copper about what it does. It makes collagen, kills germs, boosting the immune system, uh, you know, boosting hormones, detoxifying. Um, you know, all of that is all very, very good. And more important than ratios is, is deficiency levels, really. And so, you know, taking zinc and copper and vitamin C as a trio of supplements to start with, there's so many benefits. You'll feel so much better uh, eliminating those as deficiencies. And the side effects of just increased collagen production alone is worth it. But then when you look at the synergy of germ killing and uh, everything else and detoxification, it's really, it's really life-changing when you add all three of those together, especially because most people, they only do like one or two. They don't do all three. Right. Right. That's a good point. And uh, before the show too, uh, I just wanted to bring this up on air because I, I thought it was fascinating and maybe you have something to add, but in my researching zinc, I found the sacrificial anode on ships. Um, that was raised, you know, kind of in a boating area in Southern California where there's, you know, the docks and just all the, the, the fishermen there. And um, the, there's, there's this zinc block. It's, it's basically put on a part of the hull of the ship and it prevents um, the ship from rusting out from the salt water. And as I was looking into it, Zinc has a more negative reduction potential. Like zinc is more negative voltage wise than iron. And so that's how it works. So it'll actually donate electrons, preventing iron from rusting on the complete opposite side of the ship. Like it's a conductive electricity process, <laughs> which is wild because that, that has to apply to our bodies. If we have oxidative stress from iron overload, I'd imagine it's copper and zinc helping prevent that corrosion inside of our body. Don't they also use like a copper infused paint on the bottom of ship's hulls to keep the barnacles from attaching too? So they're using both zinc and copper, aren't they? Yeah, I think even these sacrificial anodes have some copper in it. It's like a blend of copper and, and zinc, but I think it's largely 
mostly zinc. But yeah, they both mm. protect against rust and, and corrosion. It's so fascinating. <laughs> And of course, in the body, they both, what did we just learn? You know, they did, they both lower iron. So they both are protective of iron in the body as well, or are protective against iron overload. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. It's amazing, the synergy. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Between my two full Monty panels, it was two years, and I didn't donate uh, between those two tests. And my iron saturation dropped, I think it was 12%, just from increasing my copper. And I was slamming uh, raw liver. I was doing like raw bison liver, elk liver, uh, beef liver, all the uh, <laughs> all the livers. And uh, I think it wasn't until the end. So I started to supplement copper. But it's interesting that I lowered my saturation. I mean, I think it went out into my blood because my ferritin shot up. Um, so I liberated the iron from my tissues. And so donating was a good idea. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a good point you oh, made that it has I guess a we lot should of... conclude with yeah, go ahead. <laughs> with once again, there's, there's really not very many good tests for zinc because um, you know it's really in the, located in the muscles and in the bones and stuff. So it's without a good test. Again, I think it's best to test based on your symptoms. What symptoms are you having? Are you having any of the numerous zinc deficiency symptoms we've gone over? You know, going to your doctor to get a test or, or, or you know, I, I don't trust the full money panel to really notice whether or not, like, it's a better test when you discovered you had dry skin and you fixed it almost immediately with zinc. It's a better test. Are you having a runny nose? Are you having congestion? We should be able to sleep at night with our mouth closed or with even tape over mouth and breathe freely through both nostrils. If you can't, then you need more vitamin C, zinc, and copper. It will take care of it. Wow, that's really interesting because a lot of people are doing the mouth taping or the nasal dilators, which is like a Band-Aid for clogged uh, nostrils. And I know if you're not mm -hmm. nose breathing while you sleep, your your brain is hypoxic, right? You're you're not getting, even intermittently, even 10 or 15 seconds in the middle of the night, that's 10 or 15 seconds that your brain isn't getting oxygen. <laughs> well, Matt, it's gotten to the point where I'm so healthy that if I have one nostril close up, it bothers me so much. I won't sleep at night at all because I know it's that's the way it's not supposed to be. Whereas it used to be that was normal for the vast majority of our my life before I got healthy. But now it's such a dramatic change. I just it drives me nuts. Of those three you mentioned, copper, zinc, and vitamin C, would you say uh, one is more important or they're all equally important for that congestion problem? That's a that's good. I think zinc is probably the most important one for the congestion problem. But a lot of people, if the trouble is, most people are more copper deficient than they are in anything else. It's me now, because I'm not copper deficient because I'm on the high copper plan because I wrote the copper book or whatever. Um, for me lately, it's been uh, low zinc causing the problems. Um, but I don't have the problem like hardly ever. So I, I mean, I've got it really well dialed in. Um, so for most people, when they start copper, they say, oh, you know, I can breathe so much better now. This is great. And that's because they're mostly copper deficient. Fascinating. Well, I'll be a good case study. I'm I'm vulnerable, uh, you know, with with what I share with people. You know, we all have issues that come and go. And uh, for most of my life, I've had congestion. But what's interesting is it's not throughout the day. So like waking up, I'm good throughout the day. I'm good. But it always starts at night. And uh, what's interesting is I noticed over the years. Oh, you're that, still getting that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are so you still getting that now? I am. Yeah. Even with super, super high copper. And so I'm thinking it's probably a zinc and vitamin C deficiency, probably. Um, well, since you're what, already doing the high copper and zinc, I'll give you another tip. And that is green smoothies. I know you're living out in the boonies and you're, not, I don't know how close you are to the nearest grocery or fresh greens, but when I started doing green smoothies, that was the number one thing that cleared out my nose and nasal congestion. And what's been keeping it good lately is making sure that I'm getting enough zinc. But I had a green smoothie today, you know, walked across the street from the hotel and there was a tropical smoothie place there. And so I had access to it and those really work for me too. That's awesome. Yeah, it's interesting. I'll, I'll just keep, keep upping my zinc and see if that, if that does it. Um, I did notice, uh, I don't drink 
wine anymore, but I had a, just a wine experiment for a couple of years and, uh, you know, I'd have just a glass at night and I noticed that made the congestion worse, which is interesting going there back go. to what you said about al- alcohol, right? Depleting copper and zinc <laughs> and, C, right? All and, three. Being a, and being a toxin, it's lo- overloading your liver. Your, your liver has to process it as a toxin, but you know, what are greens? Greens are very detoxifying. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Um, yeah, we have quite a quite a few uh, questions, Jason. Did you want to jump into those, or did you have anything else first uh, to go into? I think I've gone um, through everything in my uh, thing in my notes that I wanted to go through. Oh, zinc. We mentioned it sleep, right? We mentioned it very briefly, but um, taking zinc at night and by itself is a very very helpful way to make sure that we get good sleep at night. Um, but doesn't mean you can have to avoid taking zinc during the day. So what I do these days, if if I'm about to do errands or if I'm just feeling a little stuffy or whatever, boom, 25 milligrams of zinc. I try to take the 50 milligrams of zinc at night, um, and that's how I get anywhere between you know 50 to 100 milligrams, depending on how much I've taken during the day. You're psychic because the first question was when is the best time of the day to take zinc. <laughs> so. there, we go. there I go. My- my the toric field is strong with this one. So you must be free the best of time fluoride. Of day, I think it's take, take zinc on an as-needed basis. If your nose is running, if you're having allergies, if, you're, if you have uh, dry skin, if you have, you know, the symptoms, if you have rashes, take your zinc, break it up as many times as you can. Because if you really need to take a lot of it first, you know, it's better to take 20 milligrams five times a day than to take a 100 milligram dose. And it's better to take it as you need it. And then make your symptoms go away. If your symptoms come back, take it as you need it. Um, that way you, you don't end up taking too much. Um, so taking on an as-needed basis or taking zinc at night so that you can sleep uh, is, is definitely the key. And we, we absorb different amounts depending on the form, right? Like that's what I was learning about applying like your copper sulfate, which is what the two ounces, I think a hundred, uh, thousand, 182 milligrams and each drop is a milligram, but we only absorb, is it, it's like 70% of that or something? I think we absorb about 80% mm-hmm. of copper sulfate and then of, um, like copper glycinate, it's 85% absorbed, but those figures are very weird because if you'll note, they say we only absorb 50% of copper if it's at one milligram and we only absorb 10% of the copper if it's at 10 milligrams. These are wildly differing absorption numbers. So I don't know how they all do their math, but you read the studies and you can, you read enough studies, you see that enough stuff conflicts. So, <laughs> but even when we only absorb, say, 10% of our copper at 10 milligrams and 90% of it is excreted, how is it excreted? Is it, it's excreted through the liver and into the bile. So it had to have gotten absorbed at some point. So how are they even measuring all this? And what the heck do they even mean? Um, people are not very clear when they write their studies because they use their own industry jargon. And uh, it's very hard to decipher what they're saying because I think half the time they don't even know what they're saying. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah, recently I've been reading a lot about ascorbic acid. You know, Carl Pfeiffer and other um, people in, in that field of vitamin C therapy and and you know, when you get into the multiple thousands of milligrams, basically it seems conclusive that the more you take at once, the less you absorb. So I think it was like, I don't know if you take 500 yeah, milligrams. Like or, mm-hmm. Same with copper. You know, the and more zinc. we take, the less we absorb. Same with iodine. 90% of iodine is excreted. And that's what the, the goal is to take enough iodine that we're excreting most of it because that's the, what they consider we finally reach the saturation point. And what I find interesting about iodine versus copper in that way is that it takes about a year on, on the high iodine program of 50 milligrams to reach full body saturation. And on copper, it only takes about a month to reach full saturation where we're excreting 90% of it. So if iodine is safe because we're excreting all of it, also copper is safe because we're excreting it. And nobody ever talks about zinc having an excretion problem. It's only that too much zinc will eliminate copper and create copper deficiency. So once we eliminate our fear of copper, gosh, how much zinc can we really take? You know, so maybe your 300 milligrams of zinc with all the copper you're taking is perf- perfectly safe. And I, I can't really give you any warnings because I don't see any. 
<laughs> well, I could tell you my hands. I mean, it's interesting reading in your group people's experiences because uh, my hands still they'll get discolored if I rub, you know, a couple of dropperfuls on my hand. And I think one one woman in your group said she got blue hands at first for the first couple of weeks and then it went away and she's hasn't had them since high dose and copper. And so that's a it's just interesting to me. Yeah, it's probably a lot of factors playing in, right? Well, I think once we get the zinc up and once we get the vitamin C up and our collagen formation is good, then we don't have the dry skin problem. Mm -hmm. And do you say with a, a year on high iodine to reach full saturation, that was 50 milligrams a day? That was it. It takes a, a year to reach full saturation at 12 milligrams a day. It takes about three months on iodine at 50 milligrams to reach the full saturation. That's how they settled on 50 milligrams being an acceptable amount because you shouldn't, it shouldn't take you a year to fix your mineral deficiency problems. It should only take about three months. Mm -hmm. I think on your site, you reference, uh, it's Brownstein, right? He has a, like the iodine protocol. So the original three iodine doctors were Brownstein, Fleckus, and um, Abraham. And uh, Abraham has passed away and uh, Fleckus and Brownstein are both now retired. So it's up to us, the next generation, to keep talking about the high iodine protocol so that it doesn't get lost to history. They did a lot of um, very great work that's still published at Optimox.com. There are about 24 different studies published by Abraham Brownstein and Fleckus um, that are uh, historic studies uh, that publish historic study results on iodine. In fact, there's one I really ought to highlight for you, and it's this. Um, they gave 3,000 milligrams of iodine to thousands of people, and none of them had any thyroid problems whatsoever. And everyone who warns that uh, iodine will cause thyroid problems, they say that 0 0.3 milligrams causes the problems. It's only because 0 0.3 milligrams is a deficiency level. And that same kind of utter nonsense is in the um, world of copper studies. There's only two studies that I know of where they say copper is a toxin because they gave people copper. One study, they only gave them the equivalent of 0 0.1 milligram of copper. And the other study, they gave them three milligrams of copper, but they also paired that copper with known neurotoxic fats. And then they blamed all of the neurotoxic damage on the high levels of copper when it was clearly the neurotoxic fats that they did. So they create these slanderous studies on very low amounts, and then they claim that copper is the toxin when clearly that's not the case. Interesting. Wow. Yeah, I found the the research tab on that website, Optimox. It's interesting. Optimal oh, levels of iodine yes, for mental, read all of mental and physical. Yeah. <laughs> you read all of that. That's some of the best uh, uh, health research anywhere. It's a fa fascinating. You'll never be scared of iodine after you get through that. Wow. Yeah. And earlier, um, I was just reminded, I wanted to ask you about B vitamins. And I think people, even though we're going off the, the rails from zinc for a minute, I think people find it interesting. And uh, you like B1, 2, 3, 5, what is it? 12. You avoid B6, right? Because you said that's a, you were reading that's a nerve toxin, I think. So too much B6 is a nerve toxin and various governments have uh, created various different, very differing limits for B6 toxicity. The UK's limit is 10 milligrams. And in a lot of B complex supplements, you can get 50 milligrams of B6. And uh, B6 can be noted as a toxin at even 20, which is why some governments have lowered it all the way down to 10. So. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm taking copper and iodine. Why? Because they're both very good for the nerves. But every now and then I'd have like, you know, a little bit of peripheral neuropathy. And it could have been because I was taking too many B vitamins. And in fact, my ultra mag, which was a combination of five different forms of magnesium, also had B6 in it because B6 is good for the heart, don't you know? And so I was double overdosing myself on B6 from the a B complex I had, which had 50 and then another 30 milligrams in uh, the ultra mag. So I had to put a stop to that. And sure enough, all the peripheral neuropathy symptoms went away and I feel a lot better. So when you learn more, you do better. And um, so now I'm no longer using, um, there is a B6, there are B complexes out there with no B6. Um, 
but I decided to buy all the bees individually. And I also didn't buy folate or folic acid because uh, there's a very, there's a lot of controversy over that one because um, folate is supposedly supposed to prevent birth defects. But if you get over 800 uh, milligrams of folate, it can actually cause birth defects. So what's going on there? And one of the problems of folate is that it masks uh, a B12 deficiency and the masking is like um, the tests end up not working. How, where have we heard that before? <laughs> so if they try to test for B12, they, the tests don't work if, if folate is there because it fixes the shape of the blood cells or something like that. So, um, but the point is high folate can cause birth defects. So, and folate is also one of those things that's fortified in all of our food supply everywhere. So I don't think we we might be able to get away with not having any folate. And so one of the things I'm paying attention to is are we developing, you know, severe tiredness? Uh, that could be a deficiency symptom of folate. But um, I'm only tired because I work out in the gym a lot. And I, uh, generally speaking, uh, I'm not tired. So um, I think I'm fine. Um, yeah, but so, <laughs> I think so yeah, too. We're taking, we're taking B1, B2, B3, B5, B7, and B12. Those are the ones I've tried to settle at, and I'm looking carefully to see if we develop any folate deficiency symptoms. Yeah, I think t- since our last interview, you brought up, um, I think in that interview, was it a- Abram Hoffer and the, was it the CIA LSD <laughs> mind control experiments? They're going down the rabbit hole. And uh, I actually found a cool Abram Hoffer lecture on. Uh, YouTube, I think it's two hours long. And I was watching that the other day. And he was, uh, it was fascinating. He was, he was talking about, um, you know, he's all about high dose niacin. um, And he was talking about how he has seen that cure schizophrenia multiple times. Like this girl was like hearing voices in her head. And then she, she found a magazine article that said niacin for schizophrenia. And so she started experimenting and she got up to like 60 milligrams of niacin in a day and the voices in her head stopped. I thought that was an interesting story. <laughs> well, niacin is a very good detoxifier. The problem with niacin is that it also lowers copper. And these guys were anti-copper advocates. Um, if you look up their Wikipedia pages, it mentions that they were ex- uh, that, that they did the LSD experiments, that they worked for the CIA. They, they were promoting and taking LSD. And if they're taking LSD, they're literally inducing a schizophrenia in themselves. So you could see why they would then devote their studies to curing schizophrenia that they had induced in themselves. And um, so niacin is a general detoxifier. Uh, so let's not go a little too crazy with our experiments and create, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, um, schizophrenia in ourselves but i think we're doing i think our experiments are a lot wiser than what they ever did but also we're not being led by the cia we're being uh we're being led by reason and logic and uh you know what works yeah you so you're not putting drops of lsd in your copper sulfate no i'm just kidding <laughs> i am not i am not i i will admit on the air to having taken lsd once in my 30s yeah was that was that the 70s the <laughs> oh yeah oh, i'm that old huh? I, was, I was born i was born in 1970 so <laughs> i thought all the <laughs> copper you're aging so <laughs> <laughs> did, did you did you and jennifer ever do the the niacin flush because isn't it like it's like niacin trampoline sauna it's like the protocol so uh, there is a niacin and sauna detox protocol. Uh, I've never followed it. Jennifer followed that for a full 30 days. Uh, she liked it. Um, it definitely did a lot of cleansing for her. Uh, she'll, she, she likes it. There were some problems with it, though. I think um, they have you take uh, a lot of calcium. She didn't do the calcium. I thought the calcium would be a little excessive. Um, they only take you up to 10 milligrams of copper and only towards the end of the whatever three to six weeks or whatever as they scale up the minerals. Um, I think they also include manganese, which could be a neurotoxin. I don't I don't trust manganese as a supplement. I don't take manganese. Um, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Um, this is a good one that we didn't talk about. Um, hopefully this episode doesn't get flagged. I think we're beyond the censorship a little bit, but 
Um, does the it sensors, really they help? They can't watch this far into it, so they don't know what we're talking about <laughs> at this point, right? Right. <laughs> does zinc really help with the loss of smell? Um, I actually experienced that for so. just a couple hours, but uh, I, I used methylene blue and that knocked <laughs> it out. <laughs> Did you take so much zinc that it knocked out your smell? Is that what you're saying? Well, I, when I had COVID twice, uh, the first time I oh. had it, I lost my smell and taste for it was like an hour. And then the second time around, I lost it for like a couple hours, but I wasn't taking any zinc um, or much copper back then. I just slammed the methylene blue. I think I was doing like 60 milligrams at least 60. a day of methylene blue. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's great. Okay. So yeah, yeah I think, but, uh, you know, I, I had, when I had zinc deficiency, I don't think my smeller was working very good and it had gotten better after I started taking zinc again. Hmm. Interesting. Um, let me see. Does zinc regulate excessive DHT and stop hair loss? Zinc is indeed associated with stopping hair loss, but I don't know if it affects DHT directly or whether it's another mechanism. Often hair loss can happen with uh, dry skin or subhereic dermatitis is what they call it, right? It's like a, it's like a rash that people get, kind of like a dandruff. Um, Zinc should be stopping things like that. But again, um, zinc is only part of the issue. It can fix both, but we also need to eliminate the toxins that are the cause or the root cause of rashes in the first place. Um, the skin is an elimination organ, just like our other elimination organs. So if things are backing up or if we have too many toxins, the toxins will come out in the skin. So it's really, it's all about detoxifying and keeping the colon clear and things like that, when then we shouldn't have those other problems. Uh, Jennifer actually had a rash on her head for 10 years straight, and we did everything we could to eliminate the rash on her head, and nothing was working, and I was absolutely surprised until finally one day I, I was watching um, Andrew Saul and his vitamin things, and it gets to the end, and he says, uh, you guys have to stop all of your artificial colors. Because they can, you know, uh, cause all sorts of things, including uh, hair loss and subhereic dermatitis. And I'm like, oh, oh, oh. So I just, I, or maybe it's something like that. Um, no, it was probably not that. But I, I just learned that, yes, okay, let's just stop all these. They're bad for you. So I told Jennifer, we have to stop. And so we stopped. And it was 10 days later, her 10 year scalp condition cleared up because she kind of had a fondness for some artificially flavored candies as well as you know spicy chips you can't go and find some uh, red hot spicy potato chips in a gas station that's not colored with artificial red dye number 40 yeah that's wild yeah and i, th I think they put it in a lot of sodas too right like uh even the even the sodas in glass well, bottles like i think fanta or whatever maybe some red yeah. maybe some red sodas yeah almost any red food coloring but then the other funny thing is that uh the guy who wrote his book on vitamin A toxicity, he said, if people are switching from these food dyes, then they're going over to these natural dyes. Well, a lot of the natural dyes are beta carotene type dyes, which are not necessarily healthier because they will also cause the same skin rashes, believe it or not, because they're toxins. The body treats them as a toxin. And what do toxins go? They show up as skin rashes. So, Wow. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> um, we had a question here, Jason. What are the best absorbed forms of zinc? Uh, would, would you say there are any forms to avoid, like that don't work or ineffective? Or well, didn't you discover that the picolinate was not as good? Did you well, tell me that? Yeah, Chris, people have said I think that. Chris, Chris, Chris Master John has an interesting video on that, and I, I think he was going off HTMA though, hair tissue mineral analysis, which I question. Okay. The accuracy of that. Yeah. I um, question the accuracy of that too. Yeah, I don't put much, <laughs> much trust. In, I don't put much trust in that or blood tests. There's no good tests. We go by symptoms. Um, we have a, a zinc glycinate. Um, the glycinate and the bisglycinate were very common for copper. It's very common for magnesium, and I just assumed it was going to be fine, and I've had no problems. I would assume that a zinc sulfate actually would be totally fine too, um, just like copper sulfate is fine. Uh, often we have the least toxicity to sulfates because sulfate is itself a detoxifier. Um, people who are mercury toxic end up having trouble with sulfates, but you need to have a clear sulfur pathway. Sulfur is a very important detoxifier. Most people have a third of a pound 
of sulfur in their bodies. Sulfur is not the toxic agent. It's the mercury that's the toxic agent. And we need to probably work on making sure that we're mercury free first. And in fact, people who have over successfully and overcome their mercury toxicity then learn to uh, tolerate sulfurs. It's not that you need to tolerate sulfurs, you need to get your sulfur detox pathways working. Stephanie Seneff of MIT has done an enormous amount of work on that. And we don't just need sulfur, but we need sulfur transporters like berries and coffee and dark beer to make sure that the sulfur actually gets successfully transported around the body so it can do its detoxification work. Interesting. Well, I got the coffee covered, so. <laughs> there we go. But, and I don't drink the beer, so that leaves the berries and coffee for me. Uh, we had a question. Do, does zinc increase sperm count? And uh, there's actually a study. Uh, zinc is, is an essential element for male fertility, 2018. And yeah, basically says it, it does uh, increases sperm motility and quality and all that have you, have you looked into that rabbit hole or? i haven't looked into that but i do know that it's good for fertility and built a uh, boosting testosterone i do know of course you know our whole society is suffering from lower sperm counts and uh we're also our as a society we're suffering from toxicity and these minerals that detoxify zinc and copper are very very important this is a really interesting one jason as a guy that uh used to roasts like a lobster in the sun in California. Um, does topical zinc in mineral sunscreen affect whole body mineral balance? I guess another way of saying, does, does rubbing zinc sunscreen on your skin improve your copper status? <laughs> so that's an interesting question um, and whole body mineral status. I believe you probably can absorb copper through the skin or zinc through the skin, just like you can absorb copper. Um, we, Jennifer and I, we had a little experiment one time where we took zinc before we went tanning and we burned significantly. Um, and so it could have been the temporary zinc blocking the copper effect. Um, usually when we have our copper up, we don't burn at all. So we looked at that and we were kind of shocked. Um, and it was just a matter of taking one zinc pill right before we went tanning and had that effect. So that's something to consider. And then, of course, there is a zinc oxide that, you know, is a white paste that people use to um, put on their skin directly when they get sunburn or protect, use as a sun protector. But that has a drawback because if it's lower in copper in the skin it could create a rebound effect where you're actually more sensitive to getting sunburn in the future. So if people are using zinc oxide, and I know ski racers used to do it, and I know lifeguards do it, you know, you need to balance that out with some copper internally so that that zinc doesn't overpower it. Is it a myth that taking large doses of zinc helps with COVID? Yeah. Have you seen that anyone use that and the benefits <laughs> without, I'm without pass copper? I'm going to with... question. Let's not get into that. Um, <laughs> I, you know, um, I think, I think, well, I'll also say, I think if, if you take so much zinc that you're depleting copper, that's the, a mistake because we need copper for the lungs for quite a few reasons. So uh, I, I'm more into keeping the minerals in balance than just taking zinc for, I think taking zinc for COVID is a mistake. I'll put it that way. How about this one? Are white spots on the nails uh, a sign of zinc deficiency? I would agree with that. They probably are, but it's maybe not a very good sign. I don't know. I don't, I don't get them at all. I don't have them at all. Um, and yet I was zinc deficient um, because I know that I was having runny nose and allergies this spring. And when I would take zinc, those went away. Uh, I was having a little bit of low libido issues. I took more zinc and that went away. So there are other signs, but that could be a valid sign, but it just wasn't a valid sign for me. And maybe that's because copper was fixing those white spots in my nails, or maybe boron or maybe iodine was fixing it so this is a really interesting one and i'm curious your, your thoughts on this uh, is is it true that based on if zinc gives you a metallic taste or not it tells you that your body needs it that's an interesting one i had read that one when i first was zinc deficient and we, i was playing around with it um i think it's supposed to what is it if you if you can't taste the zinc then you're zinc deficient. And if you can, then you're sufficient. And uh, what we did in my whole house is I couldn't taste the zinc at all. And I was deficient. Um, and only one person 
in the whole household, my youngest, Hayden, when he was about five, thought it was horribly yucky. <laughs> so, but I don't put, but here's the thing with copper sulfate. Um, some people think copper sulfate is sweet. Other people think it is bitter. I'm like, what, sweet? No, you, you're kidding me. It's horribly bitter. So I don't put too much faith in whether how it tastes on whether or not you're deficient. The best way is to go by actual deficiency symptoms by learning what zinc actually does. When we know that zinc improves testosterone, you know, you can get a testosterone measure, but you can also test testosterone through looking at your libido. Is your sex drive high? If your sex drive is high, uh, you probably don't have a zinc deficiency. If your sex drive is waning, you are more likely to have a zinc deficiency. Um, this is a kind of esoteric one that's fun. Uh, <laughs> Ask him to talk about the old notion of zinc being the male mineral and copper the female. When someone else asks, what planet is zinc related to? Have you looked into the, any any of the weird stuff about zinc? <laughs> so I I don't put credence in that either because we're all human and we all need both. Um, some people say that women are more susceptible to copper toxicity because estrogen leads to uh, you know more copper, and I that's I think that's completely false. Um, People who talk about uh, IUDs and the I copper IUDs causing copper toxicity, that's false because not nearly enough copper can come off of that uh, IUD to create problems. It's creating an artificial pregnancy relate, raises estrogen. That's the problem. And estrogen raises copper because estrogen is a pregnancy hormone and pregnant women need to have copper in their blood to let it get to the baby. Because babies have desperate needs for copper because, uh, you know, babies have uh, 10 times more copper in their bodies per pound than adults do. And that is a sound refutation of copper toxicity because babies are not born copper toxic. Babies are some of the healthiest uh, cohort of all human beings. Um, you know, kids suffer from the least amount of diseases. Um, I think the only reason why babies suffer a lot is probably because they're assaulted by the medical establishment so regularly. And then when kids reach, reach about age five, they're no longer so regularly assaulted by the medical establishment. And it's really five-year-olds that have the least, uh, lowest mortality of all age groups of all humans. I was very happy wow. when my kids reached age five. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was a, a teacher's aide and a substitute teacher at Juvenile Hall for four years. And it I just always think back to, uh, you know, I was out there for PE class with the kids and I, I'll just never forget them like running around doing laps. And I look up and it's just tic-tac-toe chemtrails in the sky. And, you know, then they're going back in and drinking tap water and eating their little packaged meals for lunch. And there's pregnant girls in there just had a baby. And I'm just like, this is really sad. I mean, these kids are so malnourished and poisoned. It's ridiculous. <laughs> you know? So do you ever see any chemtrails above your house? You're living way out in the boonies, right? Where, where are you living? Can you even say? <laughs> North Idaho. Yeah, almost to Canada. And and yeah, actually almost every day. Um, but I think sometimes there will be some months off. But then again, I hear they just spray at night sometimes. You know, they just switch it up and. At night, you can't see them, right? So, <laughs> oh, it's red nights. You can't even see the chemtrails. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> and that's that's part of my case for supplementation because I have you know anti supplementers on my show, or I've talked to them, or they're on social media or whatever, and friends, and I'm just like, look, this is just one more case for supplementation. I mean, you're not going to counter poisoning like that right. with food alone. Okay. <laughs> That's that's right. We live in an artificial world. You know, babies are assaulted with 600 toxins. Good thing they get copper. <laughs> yep. And you, you kind of uh, talked about this a little bit earlier, but best food sources for zinc. Um, so you said beans, right, is one. Uh, so, yeah. So oysters are out, actually. They're the highest in zinc and they, they do have positive effects, but they're they're so loaded with toxins. I'll, I'll want to cross them off the list. So really, it's beef. You can get about uh, I got five milligrams in a serving or a typical serving, and because I'm a big guy, I I usually measure my beef in pounds, not ounces. You know, uh, so what is it like something like five milligrams in three ounces of beef? But I'm always I'm always eating like you know, 
oh, I will order the bag of burgers, please, five of them. I'll give one to my dog and I'll eat four hamburgers myself. Um, so, and then the second one is probably, yeah, beans. So what's interesting is that uh, uh, the low vitamin A diet from Grant Genero is, is uh, uh, beef, beans, and rice, which are high zinc foods. And zinc makes that, uh, what is it, the retinal binding protein. So it's interesting. People pick their poisons, right? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, seeing if there's any other questions here. Yeah, another one on symptoms. The size of the moons on your fingernails, does that, is that affected by zinc levels? I don't notice really any very many changes of the moons on my fingernails. I have several fingernails with no moons and some with moons. Here's, I don't know if you can see, there's a little bit of moon on this, on this one, right? But on this hand, I have no moons. So, or I have a moon there on that one. Um, and it's been that way for years. So I don't know if that's a very good indicator of anything. Yeah, I've heard B vitamins, you know, because people try to, they diagnose by the nails, the ridges, the white spots, the, you know, the moons. Um, and I've heard B vitamins play play a big role in their our nails. Yeah, I don't look at nails much of as a symptom at all of anything. I, I haven't really um, put too much credence in that. I think, I think there are nail readers who, you know, come up with these ideas. And I, uh, I haven't found that to be too reliable. I think the nails grow very slowly. Whereas you can mm. develop nasal symptoms extremely fast. Mm. Um, why do I get headaches from, from taking zinc? I'm going to ask. When people start detoxifying minerals and vitamins, they can develop headaches often because they're just stirring up so many toxins. And I think the answer is that the more different supplements you take that are det detoxifiers, they all sort of help each other. Um, one of the solutions for iodine headache is salt, and one of the solutions for the copper headache is uh, vitamin C. I don't know why. I just know that that's what happens. Um, people in my forum who forget to take the vitamin C uh, often will develop those headaches, and I say, well, try the vitamin C because you haven't been doing all of it, and then they try the vitamin C, and then they're like, mm, my headache went away in minutes. How did you do that? I'm like, well, thank you. <laughs> 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 do you think do you think maybe sweating in a sauna could help to kind of push out those liberated metals probably probably um you know making sure you're going poop enough right when i was a, <laughs> i always wanted to write the health book called the uh you know uh, go poop enough and lose five pounds diet plan or something like that. You know, I mean, there's so many people are so constipated um, that they really just need to, uh, I don't know, take a laxative or take more copper or take more vitamin C and get the get the thing moving. When they say open up your detox pathways, I'll tell you, most of the toxins, they come out in the poop. So make sure you're pooping. Um, constipation is really, really unhealthy. So now a lot of people, they, they ask questions like, well, well, can I take these things while I'm breastfeeding? I'm worried about toxins coming out of my milk. No, toxins don't come out in milk. They come out in the poop. I wonder if uh, a lot of people just aren't retaining magnesium, right? With uh, the boron deficiency and That's copper too, right? Think, because... you know, right? Copper and boron are very, very seldom taken. And what else is going to help us hold on to magnesium? So I think probably, you know, if most people are suffering from boron and uh, copper deficiency, then yeah. They're probably having magnesium retention problems, which sort of explains why Occupation. <laughs> people are over enamored with taking so much magnesium. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Um, well, that was all the questions, Jason. This was a lot of fun. Um, I knew it would be. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure it's a continued discussion. I like your just experimental mind and um, that you're willing to experiment and change. Um, that's admirable and someone that's, you know, uh, chronologically older. <laughs> so <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Thank you so very much. Um, I have enjoyed this discussion again. Um, and, uh, thanks for having me back. Um, I, uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And your website's, um, revealing fraud.com and you have a lot of great, uh, blog posts up there and resources, right? Thank you. I have written a lot more blog posts since I 
publish my book because I'm learning so much in the forum and in the feedback. And in fact, I think I have to thank you for having me on your show the first time. I had only about 300 or 400 people in my forum when you had me on the show the first time. And we talk about an early adopter. You adopted me so early. Uh, now we are up to in the forum in just a couple of months now from then. Now we're up to 3.6 thousand people. So that's that's been fun to watch that growth happen. And I'm just I'm spending almost all my days answering all these questions in the forum. And I, I'm so glad to see you post there uh, on occasion. And uh, I was so glad to help you uh, find your way into the zinc as part of the protocol. It was in there in the quick start guide all along. Um, but I'm so very glad that you found your way back into that. Uh, and how much vitamin C are you taking? That's the other part of my protocol. How much vitamin C are you are you taking? Yeah, so Jason, you're open up a can of worms here with this question, but <laughs> so so I actually yeah, sell. We'll a whole we, have, we have seven minutes left. <laughs> so I actually sell a whole. You know, I have a, a supplement company, Mita Life, uh, and I sell um, whole food vitamin C, which I've been taking for for years um, since discovering Morley's work, and you know, studying the the uh, tyrosinase thing and the bioflavonoids, but you had me, uh, look into, uh, Andrew Saul, uh, Carl Pfeiffer. Um, I think Abram Hoffer has some material that he did on, on vitamin C. Um, I'd known about Doris Lowe for several years. So I revisited her who says that vitamin C is, is ascorbic acid. They're synonymous terms and there's no such thing as whole food vitamin C in the clinical literature. It doesn't exist. Uh, and so, um, it, she also said that ascorbic acid is a redox balancer. It's not just an antioxidant. And so she said, it's like our primary redox balancer in the body, you know, that reduction in oxidation, that donating and accepting electrons. She said, that's all orchestrated. Like, like vitamin C is the conductor of that orchestra of that redox orchestra. So I've been just meditating on that. Um, obviously vitamin C is needed to make dopamine. We, they often say it's just for the adrenals, you know, but it's also needed for brain function and dopamine, which I think a lot of people are just dopamine deficient. Um, so yeah, just been having fun diving in and to answer your question directly. I've just been experimenting with it. Um, I feel comfortable now that copper is coming in, taking it. Whereas if I didn't have any copper coming in, I would be skeptical, you know, like all the people the last two years taking ascorbic acid without copper for COVID. I think that's a mistake um, because copper's part of that, you know, orchestra uh, for immune system and energy and all that. So, yeah, been been just experimenting. Uh, I've tried like 500 to 1000 milligrams every hour or whenever I remember and from what I've researched, it's more about frequent doses than all at once. Like we talked about earlier, the absorption. Um, I think, you know, if you took five, you know, five grams of AA of ascorbic acid, you only absorb like, I don't know, 10%. Like basically the more you take, the less you absorb in one dose. But if someone has a cold or fever or something, their tolerance goes way up for it, which I found fascinating where they could take a hundred milligrams all at once and have no bowel dump, you know? So it's, it's, it's interesting that our needs for vitamin C go up with, uh, with infections and things. So yeah, I've just been having fun looking into it with like a childlike curiosity and an open mind and just having a greater perspective of, of it. But, um, I don't think whole food vitamin C is bad. I just think, um, is the active component that two atoms of copper or is it ascorbic acid in the whole food C? I would imagine it's the ascorbic acid. And I think you might have pointed out that it's a lot more expensive to take the food based form. You're doing just berry powders and trying to get up to a thousand milligrams of ascorbic acid. That's quite a bit of whole food C versus just taking the isolate. You know, and there, there could be other cofactors in the whole food C um, in the plant nutrients uh, um, besides just the lysine and the copper. I mean, I'm not saying the whole food C is bad, it's just expensive. And, uh, for my own needs, I think I would rather do the the sorbic acid. I think you covered the whole gamut of material there very well. <laughs> I agree with you on just about everything. So 
I think uh, I think I'll let you have the last word on that. I think that, I think that was all good. I think you made a very good point that ascorbic acid gets a lot safer with the copper that we're taking because we're not depleting our copper, and we're so far ahead of our forebears, right? The um, Hoffer, the late Hoffer and Pfeiffer, who were um, advocates of C, I suppose, but were you know. Um, not fans of copper they didn't understand i guess what they were doing or maybe they did who knows but i think we're doing it better and that's that's the point you know when you know better and learn better we do better and uh, i think we're doing really good i i agree yeah it's really fun to experiment and connect these dots because someone has to experiment right instead of just reading these people's material and just being you know an anti-copper advocate like they were it's like no how about we combine the information take what's good leave the rest and create a new thing which That's you're kind right. of doing with well you just compl- you just complimented me with for having an open mind and look at you and your open mind looking into this again and um also you know the, the, given the fact you're selling old food c there's a con- potential conflict of interest right there and i i trapped you i didn't know that i was going to trap you because i don't look at what <laughs> you're selling um so well done matt well done I appreciate it i mean i would say if someone's not on your protocol or not on copper sulfate are not taking more than 10 milligrams of copper, they'd probably be better off with whole food C. But if they are upping their copper to let's say 50, 100 milligrams, they might need more than whole food C or something in addition to. Yeah, that's basically my position too. You know, if, if we're taking a ton of copper, it can induce some headaches and we need more detoxing of power. And maybe whole food C, you could get there if your pocketbook was big enough, you didn't mind spending 10 to $20 a day on it. Because I, I really think, um, you know, a thousand milligrams is almost the bare bones of vitamin C. Uh, in fact, I've experimented with how little vitamin C I can get away with. And, and if I, we did a uh, thousand milligrams of vitamin C every fifth day, and I, were, I was getting little micro bleeds on my hands, so my collagen formation was a little off. And they say that's one of the problems of copper toxicity is that it can induce a scurvy. Uh, like symptom because it could overpower the vitamin C. So if we're taking a lot of this copper, we need to need to have the vitamin C. I, I did a lot better with um, vitamin C, thousand milligrams every day, but just because it's better doesn't mean it's ideal. So I've been experimenting with more because I've been able to, let's say, uh, not be so intimidated by Morley's um, view that C will block our uh, or our copper because I'm taking so much copper. Since I'm taking so much copper, I can handle more of the antagonists. But it's not really an antagonist because vitamin C has at least uh, 15 different synergies with with copper. The you know they both make collagen, they both kill germs, they both boost our immune system. Uh, you know they're both great for the blood supply. They both they're both great for our circulation. Um, when things are in synergy, it kind of explains the antagonism because if we need both vitamin C and copper to do something in the body. And if copper was the lagging ingredient and it's no longer the lagging ingredient, then vitamin C is going to be the lagging ingredient that we're going to run out of faster with our normal metabolic processes. So it's not about finding the, you know, the maximum copper we can take with the minimum zinc and minimum vitamin C that avoid deficiencies, we want to take the optimal amount of copper, the optimal amount of zinc, the optimal amount of vitamin C. So uh, I, I so my optimal ranges right now are roughly, say, 2,000 milligrams of vitamin C, 30 milligrams of uh, oral copper, 70 milligrams of topical copper, and anywhere between, say, 50 to 100 milligrams of zinc. That's where I'm at. And I might change. I might, I might change. Yeah. How many yeah. dropperfuls does that amount to, Jason, of copper, the 70 milligrams? Do you know how many roughly of the copper sulfate dropperfuls? You know, I are? don't go a full dropper. I do like about a three-quarter of the dropper or a half the dropper in the, in the palm of my hand, which is about, I guess, is about seven drops. Because if I put 10 drops in the palm of my hand, I'm going to spill some on the floor. So about my palm can only hold about seven and I put my two palms together and then I slap it on the body and I count maybe roughly 10 of those. So that's why I say 70, but it's very sloppy and it's very quick. And I'm guessing it's rough. You know, I just apply it everywhere. Go fast. Right. Right. Well, yeah, those are great points you made. And um, yeah, I, my next rabbit hole I want to dive into is ceruloplasmin activity. It's relationship to 
ascorbic acid um, because there's ceruloplasmin level or amount in your body, but then there's the activity, which is you can only measure that in Spain and Europe, morally said. Um, it's like illegal to look at the activity in the US. So I'm curious, but um, that's why, I, you know, I, again, I know it could get too high and get out of balance, and that actually causes. I think psych- psychosis and and some some mental uh, problems if ceruloplasmin gets too high. So it's all, yeah, it's all about keeping things in range. So. Well, it's <laughs> it's very interesting you say that because since the last show, I began to look into ceruloplasmin too, and I found that uh, ceruloplasmin is often very high in people with arthritis, and I had and recovered from arthritis. So, as a marker, is high always good? Maybe not. That's very interesting. And I, I don't know why it's high in people with arthritis. It just I just know that it can be. And I know arthritis is not a very healthy state. So is high ceruloplasmin always associated with increased health? And the answer is maybe not. On the other hand, on the other hand, the body is a very wise machine. And it could very well be that when we have arthritis, the body has such a great need for copper. The body is wisely making increasing ceruloplasmin high so that when we do get copper, it will make sure that it goes where it needs to go. We don't know whether or not ceruloplasmin is bad just because it's high in a bad state. Very, very difficult to study these things. It's often we only just know tiny glimpses of information and the interpretation. You have to look at whether or not it can be interpreted in either a bad way or good way and consider both possibilities. And it can be open-minded to, to all the possibilities and rather rather than just getting um, uh, a one-sided view on things. That's awesome. I love it. That's a good good place to close out. And so uh, I'll put the links to all Jason's stuff below. It's revealingfraud.com. That's a great hub where you can find his first book, Beyond the Arthritis Fix, uh, his new book, The Copper Revolution, um, the Facebook group uh, where you can ask questions and see people's experience experiences. And um, thanks so much, Jason. We got to do this again. It's always really fun chatting with you thank you matt i really enjoyed being on the show you're you're wonderful thank you so much appreciate it all right stick around as we close out well that wraps up today's show hope you guys got some interesting information out of that i like bringing context to the discussion of health with this podcast and i find that that's lacking in a lot of health information, staying open-minded to nuance has really helped me in my understanding of human health. And not everybody has to take 100 milligrams of copper a day. He's just shining a light on the safety of increasing our copper intake. And that's a very modest amount. As he said at the start of the show, It's when that metallothionine gets overwhelmed that copper toxicity kicks in. And that's between 5,000 and 10,000 milligrams. So that's a far cry from 100 milligrams. And since our last talk, I've been just meditating on the idea that you can create a copper deficiency by eating oysters. So you can create imbalances from eating whole foods. And back to what I told Jason about the cattle and the liver biopsy that was done on cattle in Texas and having minimal to no copper in their liver, we really don't know unless we have the farm ourselves. And as I mentioned, that is the goal. We need more people that are learning about how to grow food. I'm really excited to learn about it with my geodesic growing domes from the company Growing Spaces. I'm sure that through that process of learning about soil chemistry and mineral balancing, that I'll connect some dots with human health. But that takes time, right? I just didn't roll out of bed one morning and start a fully off-grid homestead with goats and chickens and growing fruits and vegetables and doing it right with being sure that the plants are getting sufficient copper and even going beyond, like I'm going to experiment with, with lodestones in the soil to increase the voltage. 
because there is an electrical process occurring at the soil level. So my view is whether it's growing fruits or vegetables or animal hub husbandry, having cattle to process into meat or any animal to process into meat, I think we could do things better. And I don't think there are enough people out there that are experimenting and pushing the envelope with innovative new ways. And I'm not talking about hydroponics or the creepy things that they're doing, growing plants in large indoor buildings. I'm talking about small scale farms, homesteads. I found it really fascinating that bicarbonate uses up zinc. That blew my mind. That makes me want to look into that further because I was slamming magnesium bicarbonate for several years and avoiding zinc like the plague. And yes, I was eating red meat, but I was not carnivore. Maybe a steak a day, maybe ground beef once a day. But if you're correcting a, let's just say, for example, in my case, a 30-year deficiency, I question whether you can do that with food. So I think there's a lot more to research with the relationship with metallothionine and zinc and copper and just the power of, as Jason said, the different metallothionines. He said it's a family of enzymes. And also looking into this ruloplasmin connection with zinc. The more I research zinc, I find that it works together with copper. They don't oppose each other like enemies. You need both, just like I mentioned the sacrificial anode on a ship. They work together to prevent corrosion. And I'd imagine that it works exactly the same way in the human body. So I really appreciate what Jason Hommel is doing. Uh, we don't agree on the vitamin A thing, and I think that's a really beautiful thing. I don't think we should agree with everyone on everything. And that breeds new discoveries. And as long as we're staying respectful, not going to character attacks, which a lot of people tend to do, I think we can get some constructive learning happening here. His website is revealingfraud.com. That's where you can get his book called The Copper Revolution. He has an arthritis fix book and the Facebook group called Copper Revolution, where you can ask questions and share your experience with increasing your copper intake. And on that website, revealingfraud.com, he actually has a lot of great blog posts. He has a ton of them, actually. And if you're new to a lot of this information, that might be a good place to start. Uh, especially the quick start guide, copper quick start guide on his website is very useful if you're interested in experimenting with this copper thing. And I would recommend if you're not taking copper, you should not take zinc because you will create a copper deficiency. It's a little tricky to not go by tests because people are all about testing, uh, plasma, the blood tests, the HTMA is the hair tissue mineral analysis tests, and everyone wants to find the numbers. And maybe someday we're going to be able to look in the tissue. Maybe they already have that technology. It's just being kept from us. I would not be surprised at all if that was the case. But as it stands now, we can't look into the liver without it being very painful and seeing what the liver stores of copper are or of the fat soluble vitamins are so maybe someday we'll have access to that and we'll be able to do that but until then i tend to agree with jason um, that besides iron i highly recommend the full monty iron panel because you can see a lot of different markers and it is useful even if it's a few times a year to look for trends in your iron saturation your transferrin all the different iron markers but when it comes to everything else, it's really difficult to get a picture of what's going on. As he mentioned, low plasma zinc does not necessarily mean that you're zinc deficient. So we didn't get a manual on how the human body works and they've made it purposefully 
complicated for us to try to get us on the pharmaceutical hamster wheel. So we're really figuring all this out for ourselves. And I think we need pioneers like Jason Hommel out there that are experimenting and pushing the limits of what's possible. We didn't talk about Sheila Jeet in the show. I really want to get Jason some My Life Panacea and see how he feels on it. I really think that Sheila Jeet is the missing link for a lot of people's health because it's just extremely balancing. You're getting calcium, magnesium, potassium, all of the trace minerals and ultra trace minerals and likely substances that we've not discovered yet all combined with that fulvic acid and fulvic acid isolated in my opinion is not the way to go but to take the whole food substance which is the shilajit resin which contains other compounds like d benzo alpha pyrones and many other things it's a symphony of nutrients that are working together to create a profound effect on someone's health. And on that topic, I will say that Mitolife Panacea did recently return back in stock. You can find that at mitolife.co. And I think as of this recording, it might be out or maybe it'll come back in, but I would recommend just checking. And if you happen to be on social media, on Instagram, we announce it on the Mitolife Instagram page whenever it's back in stock. And we recently were able to finally get a shipment in from Russia. And that's been a whole lot of work because of the current world events. But that is easily one of my top five favorite supplements. If I only had to pick five, that would be one of them. I take five tablets, which is one gram with my breakfast after I eat breakfast. And sometimes I'll take it later in the day, but every day I'll take five tablets. Maybe I'll take a day off here or there just to see if I feel a difference. But it is definitely an energy booster, a mental clarity booster, and just an overall energizer for the entire system. And my website is matt-blackburn.com. You can find all of my recommended products up there as well as my updated CLF protocol with my new information that I've discovered about vitamin A protecting from lipid peroxidation. I want to give a shout out to my favorite red light therapy company. They're called Gemba Red, and they just released a new overclocked body light. So it's a full body light panel that contains both red and near infrared LED lights And what I really appreciate about Andrew, the owner that I've had on my podcast a few times, he really dives deep into the literature on red light therapy and debunks so many myths on his YouTube channel. He gets really, really technical with it. And he actually posted today that the common wavelengths for red light therapy devices, you'll notice, is 630 nanometers and 850 nanometers but 660 nanometers and ones that they actually don't usually use in popular uh, well-marketed red light therapy devices they're not using those wavelengths i think his device really helped me through the winter here in northern idaho where there's not a lot of light not only uv light but just light in general I feel like it really helped to keep me going so I could jump back on my tractor and clear my driveway of snow. It definitely helped to keep me energized. So thank you guys for listening. There's a new episode released every Friday. Check out the Mitolife Academy. I put a lot of time and energy into that. That's my private YouTube membership. If you sign up for the advanced tier, you get four private videos a month. And if you sign up for basic, you get one video and a live Q&A once a month. And if you sign up now, you get access to all of the previous videos, which I think is approaching two years now, of a lot of information. Some people would call it biohacking tips, 
but it's way more than that. I'm not just plugging affiliate links. I'm talking about minerals in depth, whether it's sodium or potassium or copper or zinc or the top EMF mitigation that is beyond the energy devices that I recommend. Just a lot of fun stuff. And the Q and A's are always cool the last day of the month because I talk about my latest research and I get to connect with members and answer questions that they have. And it's just a whole lot of fun. So check that out and stay tuned for the next episode that's released every Friday here on iTunes, Spotify, and Stitcher. I will see you guys next week. Stay supercharged.